Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the Tuesday, April 10th, 2018 meeting of the Historic Site Preservation Board meeting, City of Palm Springs, California. May you have the roll call, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Member Hayes? Here. Member Lavoie? Here. Member Dixon is excused. Member Kaiser? Here. Member Marsh? Here. Vice Chair Burkett? Here. Chair Johns? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, and while we're at it, may you have the acceptance of the agenda? <laughs> the, um, the agenda was posted outside of uh, City Hall Council Chambers and the Planning Department in accordance with applicable law. All right, excellent, thank you. So, members of the audience, uh, this is our public comment period. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the Historic Site Preservation Board on agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Although the Historic Site Preservation Board values your comments pursuant to the Brown Act, it generally cannot take any actions on items not listed on the posted agenda. There will be three minutes assigned for each speaker. Testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no public hearings on our agenda this morning, so if you choose to address the board, now would be the time to do so. Anyone wishing to address the board, please come forward. Good morning, have a seat. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Bernstein. I am one of the owners and founders of Destination PSP. Uh, we own a retail store at 170 North Palm Canyon inside the Town and Country Center. Uh, we moved into the building about three years ago um, into a vacant space. We didn't know all the whole history, but uh, we feel in many ways we helped revitalize the idea of having a viable business inside the Town and Country. Uh, we work with over a dozen different local nonprofits, including the Preservation Foundation, PS Modcom, and Modernism Week. Um, it's been a very difficult few years. We've lived across from a construction zone uh, with debris and dust. Uh, we've had no, very little walk by traffic given that. Um, the city did not actually help in sort of driving people down there. At the time, uh, we received certain funding to replace the uh, windows. Um, but there was no economic development plan for the downtown. So most of what we did, we did on our own. Um, we believe very strongly uh, that Palm Springs is not just about preserving the historical architecture, but also the livelihood of local and small businesses. Um, and to that end, we've, we've really tried hard. We produce all of our own products. We make them locally. Um, we now employ about 20 different people um, who are all from the Palm Springs area. Um, we are absolutely thrilled about the, the uh, renovation of the town and country with the painting and, and other types of um, things. It's been, the building has been um, obviously dilapidated and, and <coughs> proven very difficult to run a business in. Um, uh, we have welcomed the developments across the street. Uh, even though we prefer local businesses, it has certainly helped to have that traffic there and have um, new, not have a construction zone across the street. However, the one thing I would say is that it still provides a lot of challenges for a local business. Um, if you look across the street or new businesses, they have huge signage, they have lots of lights, they have um, all kinds of awnings, everything that seems to drive business there. So our challenge is now to drive businesses, not just to look at the building, but to go to the businesses inside the town and country. So the reason I want to speak today is that while I love all the, the, the bringing it back to the original, I would encourage the consideration of how lighting, signage, awnings affect a business. Um, and as a local business, it means a lot. If you look across the street, most of the businesses on, the, on that uh, east side of the street, the windows look dark all day. Uh, it just has to do with the lighting on it. So, Signage is very important to us. Um, I know they want to take down the wall signs and put on blade signs, but we would need to have something so people across the street see that there is an active business there. Um, the awnings do protect us from a lot of the heat, um, some of which is being blocked now but, uh, by buildings. But in general, the idea, my reason for speaking today is that in, in consideration of these great improvements, which we fully support and we can't wait to happen, that you talk to some of the businesses um, or look at some of the businesses and see what their needs are in terms of drawing traffic to there. Because if the building ends up being this beautiful class one historic building that's been renovated, but it doesn't have a viable business, it would be quite difficult um, and may not, may not thrive. Um, and the structure itself provides a lot of challenges just in terms of space. So 
with that, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I'm always available, anyone in my company, to speak to anyone, either from the um, uh, architectural firm or um, GRIT or, or the board, um, and uh, show you some of our, our business. Thank you very much. Jeffrey, thank you. Anyone else in the audience today wishing to address the board? Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Please introduce yourself. I'm Peter Maruzzi. I'm the advocacy chair of the Palm Springs Modern Committee. I'm just here to reiterate what Chris Menrad, uh, ModCom president, presented at the last your last meeting, specifically about revisions to the preservation ordinance. And I don't. I think you received a copy of our yeah, recommendations. Okay, on page three, just to focus on the key sentence in the whole document. Um, under class one, the sentence that we uh, inserted was, a class one historic site being nominated for architectural merit must manifest integrity of design, materials, and workmanship. And the key here is architectural merit, because I know that sometimes you have... Pete, excuse me. Gentlemen, we need to be paying attention to our speaker. Please, thank you. Pete. Uh, that you, you nominate or you consider properties that are not necessarily um, important for architectural merit, maybe for historic personages, for historic associations. But in the case of architectural merit, where, the, where what you're focusing on is the building's architecture, we really believe that um, that property must exhibit um, integrity of materials, workmanship, and design. And of course, there are defined you know, in, the, in the document and they're the standard, you know, Secretary of Interior's uh, definitions. Because if the point being is, is that you're trying to promote the architecture and its historic design, if so much of the origin, original design is not manifest, what is it exactly that you're trying to designate? And in the City Council, some of the members at the last, uh, one of the recent meetings did verbalize that there was some concern about um, at least for architecture, that integrity is not being considered as strongly as it should. So just to finish up, we strongly encourage you in your discussions about the revisions to the ordinance to, to seriously consider what we're recommending and uh, include that in your presentation to the City Council. Thanks. All right, thank you, Pete. Anyone else in the audience wishing to address the board this morning? All right, seeing none, we'll close the public comment. Item number one on our agenda is our consent calendar, and this is the approval of the minutes. Board, have we had an opportunity to review the minutes? Any changes, edits, corrections? I move to accept the minutes. Thank you. Second. And a second by uh, Vice Chair. All right, uh, any further discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? <clears throat> okay. Uh, Ken? Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. All righty. As I mentioned, we have no public hearings this morning. We'll go directly into our unfinished business, uh, 3A. This is a citywide historic resource survey. <clears throat> Addenda. The theme, communities of color, non-Native American population. Ken, the staff report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as noted on your staff report, uh, the city... Council did approve the uh, initiation of the um, citywide historic resources survey in 2014. This um, material that you have before you is an addenda to that, which uh, picks up an additional uh, context portion, communities of color, looking at non-Native American populations and their contributions and influence in the development of Palm Springs. Uh, so the uh, purpose of this particular item bringing forward to you today is to review the matter, uh, give us any comments or feedback you may have, and our recommendation uh, for you is that uh, you would uh, be able to recommend to the City Council the inclusion of this addenda in their approval of Case 5.3-2028, the Citywide Historic Resources Survey. That concludes my staff report. 
All right, excellent. Flynn? Mr. Chair, one of the things I just wanted to mention is at last month's meeting when we distributed this to the members, Member Dixon made some comments about the inclusion of maps in this chapter. She thought that would be helpful. So I just wanted to make sure that that was on the record that we will include that as a comment in terms of the comments we're taking from the HSPB members. And we'd welcome any other comments that you might have at this time. All right, board. Mr. Chair. Um, this is an excellent report. Um, it was very interesting reading. Thank you. Anyone else? I have a, Todd? No? All right. Um, I read the report, and I really agree. I mean, I thought it was just really, um, uh, I learned an awful lot from this. And two things, and I did make notes here, uh, but I'm having trouble finding, oh, here it is, okay. So two of the items that I thought was really, um, uh, wonderful to learn is that Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, which is on El Segundo uh, in the former Section 14 area, is still extant, and it's probably one of the last remaining buildings of Section 14. So I have a whole new renewed respect for the uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. The other item that I found, uh, that I learned, is that, um, and this is on page uh, 29, of the uh, addendum. Uh, it's the rendering of the First Baptist Church of Palm Springs at 588 Rosa Parks Road, commissioned uh, or envisioned by architect Lawrence Lapham. So here again, the name Lawrence Lapham comes up. Uh, we've been talking about Lawrence Lapham for the last year or so, learning more about his work. Uh, the Crocker Bank on Palm Canyon Drive, which was recently designated a historic site. Um, and again, just learning more about Howard Lapham. Uh, there will be a, uh, a feature on Howard Lapham during the Historic Site Preservation Board Symposium uh, this coming weekend, so we'll be learning even more. Uh, but my question for staff is, and I did not have an opportunity to drive there, is this uh, First Baptist Church there? Do we know? Does anyone know if that First Baptist Church still exists? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do not know. I believe it's there, but okay. I have not had a chance to go up and survey it. All right, so I think we have a homework assignment then. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, and it's a, it's a very uh, handsome-looking church as it was rendered here. So those are my comments about uh, the um, Historic Site Preservation Board staff report on the Citywide Historic Resource Survey addendum. Uh, do we need a, a motion on this? Yes, please. Please. Mr. Marsh, would you turn your speaker on, your microphone on, please? A reference to last go. Sunday's De Desert Star about the gay community in, in Palm Springs, and the article indicates as early as uh, 1913 there were minority gay population here. And um, in San Francisco, we actually we did a context statement specifically for the gay community in San Francisco, and it seemed to me that um, an extension of this might be doing a context statement on the gay population in, in Palm Springs. Um, I don't know, I'm just tossing that out for consideration uh, since it's not addressed in this, in this uh, context statement. All right, Vincent, I appreciate that. Bill? Mr. Chair, actually, Vincent, that was included in the report that we, we, we read, yeah, in the one we have. Okay. There was a whole section on I think so. um, that, that contribution. Okay, excellent. Um, you know, I did read the report, and I actually missed that. So it's, it's a small section on the report. Okay. Dick? I would just like to say that I was, you know, actually I was surprised that this wasn't already a part of the report, and I totally missed it. And this is so important. And I am really, really happy that the city authorized uh, this to, uh, to uh, survey to continue. And, uh, you know, I, I think I became aware of this um, when Renee Brown, maybe two years ago, and she did the program on the presentation on the, the uh, influence of women in Palm Springs. 
And when she did that, she also brought in all the diversification of this town way back into the 20s and the 30s. And, uh, and, and this, uh, this was certainly a, a part of it, you know, including uh, also an all-female tribe uh, the integration of the schools back then uh, that happened, and then the women that really were the powerhouses. So this is such an integral part of what we should have, and I wholeheartedly uh, support this very much so. Excellent. Uh, and for the record, uh, the newspaper article in the Desert Sun that Vincent referenced was written by the President of the Palm Springs Historical Society, Tracy Conrad. And to further that, the Palm Springs Historic Society's PS Talks program will conclude on Tuesday the 17th with a talk uh, on a gay community in Palm Springs. So uh, the gay community is getting some uh, attention of late. So we, I believe we have a first and a second. I missed the first and second. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe that was the prior. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll look for a, uh, uh, Todd. All right, Todd moves the first. Second. And Mr. Lavoie the second. And a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All righty, moving on to our new business, item number four on the agenda. This is 4A, case number 3349. Uh, this is the Sandcliff Homeowners Association requesting certificate of approval for installation of screen block garden walls in various locations at the Sandcliff Garden Homes Historic District located at 1800 South Barona Road. Staff report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you have uh, considered in the past recently, uh, this is a um, particular detail that the Sandcliff Homeowners Association is requesting the board to provide a blanket approval so that individual homeowners uh, who choose to have these screen block walls added to their outdoor patio areas for privacy may do so. In uh, similar to other um, blanket approvals that you've done, uh, in the case of Sandcliff, you actually most recently did a, a standardized blanket approval on their doors and window replacements. Uh, you've done similar types of um, blanket approvals at uh, Racket Club Cottages West on the uh, kitchen windows and those details. Uh, so this is a standard sort of process for you. And what they're looking for is uh, your approval of the screen block walls as proposed in the attached material so that if individual homeowners do wish to do this, they would come into the city, they would apply for their building permit, but when they come to planning, we would reference your blanket approval on this in order to process them and allow them to then go into the building permit process. And the applicant is in the audience to answer questions that you may have on this one. Ken, so you don't have a visual? I don't have a visual, but the materials are in your packets. They are indeed. Um, and again, um, last evening, uh, I was not able to get the images any larger than small. The rest of uh, the entire agenda opens up for me large, and but I was not able to look at this with much detail, but it's okay. Um, I'll turn to the board for comments, please, or questions of staff. Mr. Lavoie. Here, um, I have several questions. What's there now? Is there any screen at all of fencing? There are some in various locations. Uh, what this does is provides the opportunity for those places where there aren't screens to be installed. Uh, is this type of wall shown on the original working drawings or part of the original development? I am going to leave that to the applicant to answer that question. I don't know the answer to that. Shall we call the applicant forward? Please. Would the applicant for agenda item 4A come forward? <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Please introduce yourself. Well, hello. My name um, my name is Jim Harlan, and um, just for a point of clarification, I'm here as the retained architect for Sandcliff HOA, as opposed to a P, uh, PSPF board member. Um, 
I can answer uh, Mr. Lavoie's question. Um, it's an interesting history. The original pod, if you look on the site plan, deviate, <coughs> de uh, deviates from the subsequent walls. The original walls um, covered the entire property, the entire frontage of the uh, condominium elevation. The subsequent uh, walls were containing only uh, discrete patios as opposed to uh, enveloping the entire front frontage, if that makes sense to you. The original uh, advertising for the complex uh, showed block walls. Um, the original block that was used was Empress. There are 11 examples of Empress on the property. We are proposing four square, and there are 62 examples of four square existing that are not to be modified. There are a couple uh, four squares, but they're being modified, and they're in this packet, so they're not part of the 62. So if you take the 62 and add the 22 additional walls, we'll be up to 84 of the four square. Um, excuse me. Um, so the, the original screen block walls were site property walls? No. The original uh, walls on the triplex were privacy walls enclosing, uh, let's say, patio and garden space. So those were extant on the original? Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. Todd, please. Did you consider going back to the original block? Um, yes, but because of the um, prevalence of the um, four square, we chose to go with the four square. And I have a survey here. I did a survey of all the existing walls, which, which I can pass out. I'm sorry, I didn't give that to you, but I have, um, I have copies. I have a bunch of copies, yes. So the, the, these are all the existing walls on the property minus a garden wall. Here's another one. Now, Here's the photo of the original block walls. I'll pass. I'll pass. There's. Uh, Bill, are those both the same? No. no. They're two different ones? Two different photos. Same uh, block uh, wall. So, do you have a, a photo like this of what your. This is the Empress. Yes. So, if. Um, let's see. The um, this is a this is a this is a blow up of the four square. It's similar to Empress, but they are they're clearly different. And let me see in my packet. Well, here the bottom photo is four square. And the middle photo is Empress. It's actually a, within the Empress, within the 11 Empress, I believe five are Empress and six are Empress variants. I'm going to show these. I'm showing these so that the uh, audience here and the uh, television audience at home has an idea of, of what we're looking at here. Uh, Jim, the one in my right hand, can you see it from there? Oh, this sure. is the four square. 
No, that's Empress. Okay, and then this that one is, is Empress also. Oh, these are both. Then these yeah. are the same. Yeah. All right. Well, then we do have. Uh, I'll pass this on. This is the new one. This is this is the proposed one. And there's another photo making the rounds of the okay. proposed. Okay. All right. Um, and oddly enough, the unit that you're holding in your right hand, they have Empress facing the street, but four square existing facing the courtyard. So certain units have both types. And this block is still readily available today? I, the block in your left hand, four square, is readily purchasable today. Okay. I'll pass this one around for the board. You've already, you have this one. Oh, here's a good shot of the four, uh, that's a four square. Um, in looking at this one, in looking at this one, this doesn't seem to be a block that I have either in my right hand or my left hand. The middle photo, yes. unit 1832, yes. is an Empress variant. Mm. There are half the Empress are variants, which is really just in a, a long, they stretch the proportion. I understand now. And that's noted on page two yeah. of my uh, summary. <clears throat> Board? Okay. Bill? Mr. Chair. Um, Bill, your microphone, please. Bill, yeah, thank you. Mr. Chair, um, I, I, I'm having a problem with this one. Um, it's um, appropriate, probably. Um, it's, um, it is removable, um, but it adds uh, uh, one of the Secretary of Interior standards is called a conjectural element. It's something we imagine might have been there, but wasn't there originally. Um, it also changes um, an historic spatial relationship by erecting all these walls. Um, and and will radic while attractive, will radically change how this complex looks and has looked historically. So I'm I'm very reluctant to support uh, this proposal. I think I understand what you're saying. I do. Um, Certainly wanting to um, enhance the homeowner's lifestyle that do not have any privacy walls or enclosure or any decorative elements. Um, I'm inclined to allow this because it does further their personal enjoyment of their space by giving them this privacy, this decorative block, these enclosures. Um, I'd like the board to weigh in here on some some additional comments. I'm just a little confused, Jim, and I apologize mm -hmm. that I'm seeing most of this right now, and that's the fault of mine last night in the computer. Um, so I'm seeing basically three different blocks at the Sand Cliff development. Correct. The Empress, the Foursquare, and the variant, right. and going forward, it would be the four square. Correct. Yes, and so then the four square would become the predominant block. There would be more four square than any of the other block. Uh, presently, it's a six to one ratio. So I have to do math then. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Okay, that's my question for now. 
But, but the, Dick, ori please. the original block, going back to the property when it was first built, yes. is, once em again? Empress. Yes, yes, what I thought, Empress. And even though there are less Empress on the site, uh, you actually, then you chose the predominance of what's already, already there. This is a very interesting question that kind of goes back to integrity again, <laughs> as to, you know, Bill, I'd like you to weigh back in on this again, because, <coughs> uh, you know, when you have a predominance this. of something, but yet there is a, you know, what, what was original, and obviously in a development this large, you can't go back, it wouldn't be practical back and everybody <laughs> switch everything out again, but going forward, then there is that question of whether you go with the original in going forward and keep moving that forward, or whether you go back to uh, the predominance. I'll, I'll, I'll try to use plain enough English. Um, we talk about prime interpretive period, and for this it was when it was built. Mm -hmm. At that time, the Empress Block was the only block on the site. So everything that was added after that is part of the current history of the project um, and, and is often allowed to remain. But um, to add something is what I was talking about, conjectural history. When, when you do a restoration, you, you, it's your taste, not the original person's taste, and your take on what should have been there as opposed to what was there. Um, and the designation is for what was there, right. not what should be there. Right. So while this is attractive, many reasons, I'd, I'd probably want one in front of my unit if I had one there. It's a lovely design. It's probably an appropriate design, but it is, is it an appropriate change to an historic resource? And what about it tells us that, that it's not part of the original? Right. The choice of a contemporary block, the four square block, probably tells us that it wasn't original. Um, okay. but, but the average person walking up to this site, I mean, it's hard for us to tell what was Empress Block, what wasn't, what wasn't. I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious to me as they go, go in front of me. Um, and, and I find the elongated probably more appropriate to the period. And, but, but, you know, that's not what they use so much of. So it, it's... It's, it's a difficulty because it's sort of like we're saying that things that were added later after the prime interpretive period are worth emulating. That's the problem I'm having. Right. Uh, Chair, may I interject? Please. I believe, um, with all due respect, I believe Ms. Mr. Lavoy misspoke. The uh, project was built over a period of three years, and when the project was finished, it had empress walls, and four square walls. I don't know why. It was the same architect. It was the same developer. I don't know why the change was done, but it was done. And, and there's two other things I'll mention. When the project was built, the screen block walls were an option, much like swimming pools were an option on the racket club, Alexander's. Not everyone chose the screen block walls in 1961 to 63. So we're, only, we're really putting what's there, what, or what should have been there there, and I designed them in a way that they would, they're not trying to emulate 1961, their current design, it's asymmetrical. Um, the other thing I was gonna mention, and this is, probably irrelevant, but this four square block has been purchased and it's sitting in the storage room waiting to be installed. And I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Todd. So um, if we're looking predominantly at the addition of privacy screen walls for individual units, Correct. And you're saying that when the complex was first built, that was an option in the original construction? Correct. 
So we're not adding anything to the original possibility that somebody could have had. They're just, I guess one could say they're exercising that option 50 years late. Is and that accurate? Yes, and I'll add to that, Mr. Hayes. Um, we're removing hedges. We're, cr we're removing walls and barriers and creating screen block walls. We're not enclosing open space. I'll leave it at that. Um, so, but I, I still so. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that no, no, no. So I, I understand what my fellow board member was talking about. That I'm trying to get my, I'm trying to better understand. Are we adding something different? But what I'm hearing is you're not asking to add something different. You're just asking to add additional to what may have been or could have been. I should say could have been originally there, which was offered, right, and could have been in that in that four square, not in the. Not in the Empress. I believe so. There's no old timers. Right. Well, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jim, um, coming back to uh, the photographs in my hand here, 1872 here at the top, it currently has a very low wall here. Will uh, that wall be raised? No. Will the new wall be added here? Correct. In front of the sliders. At the at the same height as this one or much taller? Six feet. So the, there will be a six foot wall and this two foot wall? Yes, yes. It, it's, if you look on my uh, survey, Anybody? well, it's a little harder, but there are eight units that have a six foot wall in the bedrooms and then a lower wall in the living room. And those are unchanged. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, also in the staff report, it says um, the project also includes relocation of the existing Sandcliff Monument signs on new freestanding walls comprised of the same solid face concrete block scored to eight by eight and screen block. Mm -hmm. The existing walls would be removed and the lettering only would be relocated. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little confused by that. What's okay. being relocated? What's staying? Um, so if, if you look on your photos, every page is uh, numbered on the... F oh, do you have photos with you? Uh, yes, on the staff report we do. Oh, not the whole... Do you want a reference? No worries. This? No, it's... um. I have the photo. So on... Um, let me try to speak and... There are two entry signs, vehicular entry signs, I would call yep. them, for Sandcliff. They're not original, as far as I can tell. Uh, they step. I have a photo of them, so I can show you. They deviate from the basic design tenets of uh, the balance of the building. So I believe they are not original. Uh, the history is PSPF granted... Um, Sandcliff money to restore the Sandcliff sign, which is painted in 57 Chevy blue. <laughs> I'm looking for the photo, I'm sorry. They got out of order. Okay, so these are the photos of the existing entry signs. And on sheet, on sheet, I think it's a 2.5, you'll, on, on the rectangular drawings, you'll see the proposed Design. Am I on the am I on the right sheet? A two point five. Yeah. So sheet A two point five on the drawings. On the on the rectangular set. Here. Show the design of the proposed entry signs. We are going to re well, we intend to reuse the sand cliff signs, and they will be mounted on solid block as opposed to being mounted on the screen block. It really fights it. So the sign will be given kind of a blank palette to sit on. And it will be down. It will be uh, lit from the ground, uplit. 
I mean, we have to get a permit for that, of course. Jim, to your to your knowledge, um, these entry signs, um, the block walls that support the word sand cliff, those are newly constructed? Uh, um, let me say they're post-1964. Uh, so they were there prior to the word sand cliff going on them? No, I believe they originally had a wooden sign, and it was replaced with an, I think, aluminum All right. sign. All right. I, I was identical. I'm just looking to the audience and some of our homeowners oh, are here, so I'm getting some, some agreement. Oh. Kitty, please, you can come forward and, and add to Jim's yep. uh, narration, please. <clears throat> please just introduce yourself for the record. Um, I'm Kitty Mayen. I live at 1811. My husband and I own 1811 and 1813 Sandcliffe. Um, just uh, by background, um, I was involved in the original application for historic designation. And I know many of you walked the property and commented on the extensive use of the screen block wall. Um, unfortunately, um, our architect, builders, and designers are all long deceased, and the records have been destroyed. So um, I acknowledge, Mr. Lavoie, some of this is conjectural, but there are pads where it's where a uh, screen block wall was never added, and that's what uh, Jim is referring to. But in other places, there is screen block wall in the existing configuration. So it's a matter of completing or adding that option. So that's the, the first question. And the, and the dominant screen block wall throughout the property is the four square. And we don't know why it was switched out, whether it was um, something that was provided uh, from a manufacturer or whatever that was. We don't have the history of that. As to these signs, um, we have um, historical photographs of the property going back to the very early 1970s or the mid-1960s, shortly after this was built, where there were entr these entryways. But on top of the signage was merely a, a wooden sign with a, a plat map. Um, the plat map, about seven or eight years ago, when we applied for the Sandcliffe signage, which we found in historical drawings, we removed the plat map to another location on the property and then remounted the historical signage, um, the script of which we drew from the original ads and advertisements that for the sale of the Sandcliffe property. All right, well, thank you for that. Any other uh, questions or comments? Jim, please. I have one. Yep, you can rejoin the. Um, thank you, Kitty. Well, um, um, Edward Durrell Stone designed the Empress block for the um, Delhi City Hall, I mean, India. And he owned the patent on it. And that might be why <laughs> it was no longer mm. used. We may, there may have been a premium for that block. I'm, it's conjecture on my part. All right, um, any more questions of, um, of the applicant? Mr. Chair. Please. Um, looking at, at the photographs of the existing block wall. Bill, tell us a page, please. Um, uh, uh, 2.7 in the photographs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it, it looks like um, the, the architecture of the building to me is, is uh, very boxy, and th that's one of its character defining features. Um, and similarly, the, the older block walls tend to have that boxiness. So I'm looking at the, your proposed design, and I'm seeing the introduction of what could be called fin walls projecting past the box, which I find attractive as a design, but perhaps not appropriate to the architecture. Could you um, talk about why you did that? Oh, absolutely. The original pod that was designed, I think, the, the, were the strongest design. They had fin walls. 
Um, I can slide the pictures around again. They have fin walls, and they actually um, changed the height. The fin walls were at one height, and the screen block walls were at another, further differentiating you know, the difference. So I, going off the original three-pod uh, expression of fin walls, I followed, I followed that as opposed to, you know, other examples. Okay, thank you. So again, Jim, um, now, and, and again, I'm seeing uh, a lot of these photographs uh, much more clearly this morning. You did mention that you're going to be removing hedges. Uh, correct. So I'm looking at, for instance, um, uh, unit 1811 here with a hedge across. Which, which what corner sheet are you on? Lower right hand corner? Uh, A2.3. Okay, and that corresponds to the architectural drawings. Okay, so that hedge would be removed. Correct. And a decorative block wall would go in its place. On 1811, just to clarify? Yes. You, correct. In that same location as the hedge? Um, yes. So what we did was, well, the short answer is yes. Okay. All right. Um, Todd, please pick it up from here. Um, just to complicate matters more, um, you're also asking to standardize the gates. Can you address a little bit, I think, isn't there something in there to, about the gates? That oh, I, yes. That's yeah. in our application. Yeah. So well, there are I, five different ty kinds of gates. Um, I do not believe that we're required to have gates. No. But... If we are to have gates, we're proposing, uh, and they are on the property, a flat slab steel clad door with a matching escutcheon. Uh, I think 1811 is the, um, the model. I could be wrong on that, but there are a few already there. But so can you explain a little bit more why you went with that style versus the other ones that are there? Well, the other ones, do you, have, I don't know if you have the staff report. I mean, they have curly cues right, and, yeah, yeah. No, no. oh, it mainly, it's the simplest design. And I think the most appropriate. Okay, thanks. Any further questions of the applicant? Vincent? Just further clarification on the Emperor's Block. Yes. Is that, is that no longer available, or is it prohibitively expensive in that you uh, went to the four square when weighing and balancing? Right. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I'm going to turn. The Empress is no longer available. Okay. Well, that answers that. Okay. That would be just the Empress is no longer available. Okay. I should have known that. Any further questions of? Uh, Mr. Harlan. All right, we can pass those uh, color photograph of pages back to Jim. All right, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, board, comments? Well, okay. I think staff is probably looking for a motion of some kind. Would that be affirmative? Okay. Um, Please. May I say one last? Of course. Thank you, all of you <laughs> who work so hard, you know, and keep me employed. <laughs> but thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your, uh, your report this morning. I have one more question back to Bill. Okay. Um, on the Empress, it's no longer available per se, but as a custom to have that made, do you have any idea of how many, uh, what the quantity would re be required to have a special run of that block? My experience has been it's very expensive. Very expensive, right? Very, very expensive. Okay. So we're back to economics, which could have been the dilemma back than when there was the change. Plus, they've already bought them. Right. Yeah. OK. <laughs> oh, 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 just one second. Uh, Bill, didn't Racket Club Garden Villas actually uh, fabricate some block? We did. 
Uh, yeah. uh, it's a very fragile block, um, <coughs> and it, it, they cost us a fortune. Understood. All right, Kitty, if one of you would come back forward, please, not from the audience, though. Um, when we began this process, my husband and I um, contacted a number of manufacturers to find out what it would cost, um, and we were given a price of about $25,000 to build a machine just for an extrusion. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is without the block. <laughs> so then we said, oh, look, we have this other block available, which seems to be the dominant block. And that um, that was how that decision was made. But when they quoted us $25,000 to manufacture just the machine, which then they owned the mold, they wouldn't sell it to us, um, <clears throat> that door was closed. <laughs> So, <clears throat> Kitty, thank you for joining us uh, back at the table. Uh, how much block have you purchased, and how did you guess, Demit, how much block would be needed? I mean, do you do you know if you have enough block for the proposal? We we do we do um, given the number of applicants of, of homeowners who have expressed interest. Um, this is a anecdotal. A bit of information, but we had a contractor come and do some work for a number of our residents on the property who mentioned that he had a connection in Mexico of somebody who had this screen block wall of the four square and had had um, a storage amount of it and was not using it. Um, and when we found that out, we said, well, given the possibility on the that there would be the ability to build the screen block walls, we um, a number of homeowners participated and decided that we would go ahead and purchase the block and hold it in storage um, because when it was gone, we were told that there would be no manufacture of it any further. And again, uh, the screen block is, even the four square is not being made anymore. Um, if you've talked with Ron and Barbara Marshall and read their book, there's all of this block is being destroyed and it's very expensive to build. So we, and we did purchase enough that we could build out um, based on the designs of the existing walls that if we had a large wall, such as a tall wall in front of 1811 and a low wall, that these would be options that homeowners had. Um, and then when Jim was hired, uh, we told him how much screen block wall and that also figured into his um, design elements or, or design of the walls as he's proposed. So we have enough. Um, we also have told the homeowners when the screen block wall is gone, it's gone. So up to this point, that, and then we would have to come up with another resource. And homeowners beyond this point, when this supply is diminished or, or completed, that we would have to come up with another solution. OK, uh, just before you leave, any other further questions of Kitty at this time? All right, Kitty, thank you again mm -hmm. for coming back up. All right, board, what is your pleasure? Thank you. Todd. I'll, I'll move we accept the staff report and the request as written. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing a second. second. Oh, there's our second, okay. All right, any further discussion on this? We have a first to accept. Um, the recommendation is to approve a blanket approval for the screen block garden walls as proposed. This does staff include the gates, the entry signs, um, the uh, whole project, yes? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, board. All right, thank you all. Thank you very much. Under additional uh, new business, item 4B, this is case number 3.1098. Eric Bovey, owner of French Miso Cafe, for a certificate of approval for exterior modifications to cottages 19 and 21 at La Plaza, a class one historic site. 
Can the staff report, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As noted in your staff report, this is a potential new tenant that's moving into two of the suites at the La Plaza Shopping Center. On page three of your staff report, you can see with the yellow highlighted square which units the uh, applicant is proposing to occupy. The scope of the work that's involved here in order to, uh, this, for this restaurant to move in, if you look at the bottom of page three, you'll note that there's two small windows uh, in the uh, north wall of the uh, two uh, suites. And the proposal is that those two windows would be removed mm. and a pair of double French doors would be put in their place. In addition, the original doors that go into these two cottages, you can see also on the bottom of page three, um, that smaller photo over on the left, um, sorry, the right side is a bit hard to discern, but there are two existing doors that were the original doors that went into these cottages. And they're more or less a solid door with a small window, of, I'm going to say roughly 10 by 10 inches at the near top of the door. Uh, the applicant would be proposing to, um, of these two doors, the one that would be um, on the left in that photo, or basically the easternmost of the existing doors, would also be removed and a um, full light glass multi-pane French door would be put in its place. The applicant is proposing that these, um, this particular space on the interior would be a, a, the kitchen for the restaurant, a small area of um, dining room, and then there would be a limited number of uh, tables and chairs with table umbrellas on the patio that you see also in that small photo in the bottom of page three. Uh, the uh, changes in addition to the doors that I mentioned is that on the roof of this, um, these cottages there will need to be an exhaust fan. Uh, and if you go to the very back of your um, uh, pages you'll see a series of um, drawings and there's a drawing that is the elevation of the north facade of the building and there you can see the uh, exhaust fan in, in its proposed location. Um, also in the back toward your pa uh, packet you will see um, uh, this particular uh, exhibit. And what I'm showing here is, again, this is the same image that you saw on page three, only it's enlarged. And the bottom photo shows a pair of French doors that exist at the La Plaza Shopping Center in the Farm restaurant. Farm occupies a similar pair of cottages on the north um, patio or the north paseo. And this is a project, of course, it's in the south paseo. Um, Lastly, uh, when we worked with the applicant in looking at this, we uh, struggled with this because, of course, it does uh, represent a, a number of changes to the uh, historic integrity of the La Plaza Shopping Center. But we identified that these were changes that were reversible if one were to take these cottages and go back to uh, some type of residential use or small office use. The French doors that are being proposed could be removed and the openings uh, filled back in. And we also did note that the, uh, this, uh, this condition of uh, installing <coughs> these French doors uh, is similar to what was also done many years ago uh, in the um, farm restaurant, as I mentioned, that is on the north uh, paseo or patio of the La Plaza. I don't know when those were installed, Mr. Chair, but uh, they do exist, and that's the photograph that the applicant has shown you. Um, in our recommendation for <laughs> approval on the front of this staff report, you'll note that we've made some recommendations in order to uh, integrate these proposed changes as much as possible, including painting out the exhaust fan to match the color of the adjacent walls, that the doors would match in style and configuration to the other multi-light doors, that the painting and the detailing of the new jam and head conditions would match the adjacent doors, which has a basically a terracotta colored um, uh, border painted around the door. <coughs> and we're recommending that if the existing wood door that is, the uh, we believe, the original on the uh, easternmost cottage is removed, that that should be preserved by the landlord and properly stored on the premises so that it could be reinstalled at a future date if possible. And then lastly, in number five, we would recommend that if you do approve this project, that the applicant uh, provide to the city for our archival records an as-built drawing of the north elevation of this cottage so that it's clear what those uh, existing dimensions and window features were so that if in the future they were to be uh, reinstalled, we would have an understanding of the dimensional characteristics for them. That concludes my staff report, and if uh, the applicant is in the audience to further clarify any questions, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, let's start with questions of staff. Todd? Um, with respect to the two side doors, the solid wood doors that they want to change out, is that a health and safety issue, or is that just purely cosmetic? Oh, you mean like a life safety issue for exiting? Correct. No, it's for uh, functionality within the uh, space. If you look at the two um, um, cottages, 
the easternmost one is basically where the kitchen would be, so you would come in that door, place your order, and then go and sit down. But so how does a different style door increase functionality? Uh, the door is, you're asking if the door is required for exiting. No, it's not no the, 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 where the, the, not the French doors, mm -hmm. the two side doors, mm -hmm. the original entry doors to mm -hmm. each of the units that mm -hmm. are solid, yes. that they want to change out to a one light. Yes. Why do they have to be changed out to a one light? Their reference on that is that uh, that door that I mentioned, there's one of the two that would be changed out, would be the primary entrance into the restaurant. So by having that as a full light glass door, Functionally, when you walk up to the space, you would realize that's the door into which you would go to enter into the restaurant. Okay. Um, and then uh, the existing photo of an existing French door setup um, in the photograph here, and I don't see a page number. No, I don't have page number. But it's, it's yes. this one? Yes. Um, those two, what look like shutters on either side, are those shutters an original feature? No, neither those doors nor those shutters are original. And in speaking with the applicant about this, they had originally shown a diagram with the shutters, and we recommended that they not put the shutters on because there are no shutters at any other doors. Great. Okay. Thank you. Other questions of staff? All right. We're going to call the applicant forward. I have but questions, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, the proposed French doors, uh, the width of them, um, it looks like the existing windows are further apart, so there'll be some infill of the adjacent wall. Uh, that's, uh, that's my understanding, um, Mr. Lavoie. The, uh, to cut those doors in will, of course, require uh, new headers and jams to be installed structurally within those walls. Okay. And um, this building, as I remember, is um, a slurry-coated slump block, which is expressed on the exterior. Uh, I don't know the as construction material. Plaza. Most of La Plaza is poured in place reinforced concrete, so I would assume it is a stucco veneer. So um, I don't know whether these are wood frame cottages or some of the structures at La Plaza are wood frame. So should the um, windows be restored at some point, the scar of this French door will always be there? It's possible it will be difficult to make those outlines go away. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I have Please. questions, staff. So... If the main entrance is the door that Todd was talking about, that is the main entrance, then the purpose of the French doors is just to draw more attraction to the facility, to the restaurant? Yes, and it provides a connectivity between the outdoors and the indoors. If you look at this particular sketch, which is the floor plan, it shows that there's basically the kitchen area is here. This would be the area where you would come in and place your order. This gallery or corridor would allow them to then come out to the outdoor seating or go over here to what would be the indoor seating. Right. And um, do you recall if um, this board reviewed the farm restaurant as far as the French doors that are over there? I looked in the case files, Mr. Burkett, and I could not find uh, a processing for those doors. So I don't know how long ago no. they were installed. The reason I'm asking these questions is I still am reminded at the El Paseo, at the uh, El Paseo, the, uh, on the corner of Tamarisk and... Uh, workshop kitchen. Uh, yeah, thank you. Workshop, yeah, El Paseo workshop El Paseo is, yeah. and, and that facade along the street, how that changed the whole character of that building. I realized those were put into like sliding doors, which is really kind of a shocker. But I, that is just still in my mind as far as any changes to those bung, uh, bungalows are so precious. But at the same time, I understand we're talking about they also need to be occupied. They've been sitting there for a long time, and it's finally beginning to happen. But <coughs> if that main door is going to, if, if the present main door is still going to be utilized, it really is difficult when you think about cutting out that space to add the French doors in this particular property. So um, anyway, thanks for answering my questions. Anyone else of staff? Um, I have one. Um, looking at the diagram, uh, 
and it's the French Miso Cafe, the North Elevation. Okay. The North Elevation. Um, and Bill, I'm going to ask you uh, <coughs> to help me with this. The bungalow to the west in this photograph has a chimney. The bungalow to the south also has a chimney? No, it does not. It does not. Um, so this uh, exhaust fan is going to be in place of a chimney or mimic a chimney or? Um, if you go to this photo, which is two or three back, uh, th this is the easternmost uh, cottage. And in the wall behind it, which if any of you have taken Mr. Kleindien's uh, yes. tour, uh, this is the area that was that recreation deck many yes. years ago when the La Plaza was constructed. And there is this chimney that's in this location. Understood. That's what I'm seeing in that drawing. Yes, it's, that's correct. It's in the background. And we yeah. don't know if there was another chimney that was part of this cottage yeah. or not. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of roof patching here. Yeah. So we don't know whether that other cottage may have had a small fireplace. And I have not been in the space myself. Yeah. Because I have just recently taken the tour again, uh, about a week ago. It's my third time on the tour. Um, and I'm remembering that each of the bungalows had a fireplace. But that's just what I'm remembering. So, again, my question is more about the aesthetic of that uh, smokestack, I'll call it, exhaust that exhaust fan. fan um, and what that's going to look like and how distracting that's going to be to the charm and character of La Plaza. Uh, I can live at the French doors. Um, I can understand why a, a, a clear light door has to be there for inviting uh, the public in. Um, but that that smokestack is just really a... Is there any aesthetic way? Bill, thank you. <laughs> Please. You want to start with I comments? I do. Yes, I do. Um, yeah, the, 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 um, the exhaust fan is not acceptable. The exhaust fan is not acceptable. Um, it needs to mimic uh, one of the existing chimneys in design. And there are ways of doing that. So, Bill, then my question is, when we talk about uh, the Secretary of Interior standards, um, we, we shouldn't mimic <coughs> something. But in a case like this, your recommendation would be that that exhaust fan be fabricated to look like the chimney on the north, bu uh, excuse me, on the west bungalow? That would be much more acceptable than, than a, a, an exhaust fan okay. painted right. any color sticking Please. up out of the roof. I would just point out, Mr. Chair, uh, that at the farm restaurant, they also have this exhaust fan. And the photographs that the applicant had shown me when we were talking about this, there was some type of metal framing that still is there around farms kitchen exhaust fan. I don't know the history of that whole apparatus, but it appears from the framing that's there that what Mr. Lavoy is talking about was attempted to be executed at the farm exhaust fan also. So uh, what he's talking about is a possibility for this one that you could, the applicant could uh, more carefully enclose this with a fireproof type of enclosure that would give the impression of a chimney rather than as a metal painted uh, okay. Fan. Um, I think uh, I'm certainly in agreement with Bill, and that's why I, I brought it up. Uh, I go to farm often, and again, as I was just on the tour of La Plaza again, uh, perhaps because of the uh, maturity of the landscape around farm, it certainly is not visible to the eye. I believe this one as a exhaust fan uh, would be very visible to the eye, and so I would object to the current exhaust fan as proposed. One other thing. Please. Um, in, in that the existing windows extend past the proposed French doors, 
I would I would suggest that the the new French doors in the middle um, be as wide as the two existing window openings. Um, so it would be a, a pair of French doors and side lights, which is compatible and typical of this type of architecture. So the cut will be straight down from the existing window. I understand. Okay. Anything else? Would it be possible if we were to allow the French doors to re have those windows, the original ones that would come out, retained? Uh, I'm not yes, quite I suppose sure. So we've, we've recommended that the door that they're proposing to remove would be retained and stored on site if possible. So I would certainly think that would not make be sense as well. then to try to I, have those windows? They probably are never going to be put back. I don't know, what, <laughs> I don't know whether you can pull them out in whole or not. I, I, they're not I, a modular I, window. I certainly wouldn't want to see them go to the uh, landfill. Dumpster. To the landfill. I, it's very hard to salvage something like I know. this and this old. But I know. So, uh, just in, in, in wrapping up, or Vincent, did you have something, please? No, I, I just want to com compliment staff and also the applicant. We're putting together a package that clearly delineates existing conditions and proposed conditions. Um, I, I think both parties have done a good job in that, and I just want to recognize that. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Chair, the applicant is in the audience if you have any questions. Okay. So, yes, I would like to call the applicant forward, but I have one more point of clarification. Uh, so, currently, the two bungalows, there is a solid wood door on the west bungalow yes. and a solid wood door on the east bungalow. Yes. Only one of those doors is being changed out. That is correct. Okay. That, I just needed that for clarification. And it's just a point of information. Those two doors currently on the inside have been walled over. So at some time in the past, the door was walled over, hmm. perhaps to make it as an office. I don't know the story behind it. but that would be removed so that the new door, the door could be reactivated again. Okay. We'll Mr. Have the Mr. Chair, for it for you. And Please. Uh, the, the roof plan shows a chimney immediately adjacent to um, the exhaust fan. Well, see, that was my question, but yes. we just learned that that is the chimney on the building behind. All right. Um, draw my attention. What's, what's Roof plan? There's a chimney here. There's a chimney here. Well, that, no, see, and I thought, that's what I thought that there was. Thank you, Bill. So the, I thought the, that the each other of the bungalows did indeed have a fireplace. So one of the options is to vent over to it, or if that, that is probably an original masonry chimney with like a 12-inch hole in the top. The applicant has looked at that op as an option, and they were not able to get into that chimney to put that up. Well, could it, could it be vented in back of the parapet? They've looked at that as well, and there are apparently structural problems that would prevent that from being accomplished. Poured so, in place concrete. Okay, so that bungalow does indeed have a chimney, or the chimney was removed. Well, if, if you look in the photo, as I say, you can see that there's a chimney that's sort of engaged with the wall. That's my understanding of the chimneys that are there. So if we propose that the exhaust fan be fabricated to resemble a chimney, are we going to have two chimneys right next to each other? Generally, but this would look a, a, a bit more like a freestanding chimney. You would basically take this metal pipe and exhaust fan and enclose it in a rectangular fireproof uh, framing that you would then put a stucco-clad exterior on with some type of a capstone. Okay. But the actual uh, uh, dome or cap of the exhaust fan would still need to be above that point to dissipate the exhaust from the kitchen hood. So yes, it would be a separate uh, fireplace or chimney. Okay, I'll invite the applicant forward, please. Thank you. Good morning. Please introduce yourself. Good morning. My name is Eric Bobby. Um, I am from uh, the south of France, so I'm very, uh, very well uh, trained uh, into what you are trying to achieve here. 
in the, the reason why the south of France looks like the way that it looks today is because it's been preserved. Um, with regard to uh, another little anecdote, uh, I took some classes uh, in Montpellier, city where I am from, um, in a class where Nostradamus was taking classes as well. <laughs> uh, so we do, we do preserve a, a lot of things. Uh, with regard to the properties that I am uh, proposing, um, there are two cheminées. There are, there are two fireplaces, one in each bungalows. The cheminées are resting against the wall of the property, which uh, goes uh, beyond uh, the roof to create a little parapet and those are, this is where the cheminées are resting, both of them. Um, the reason why you cannot see the exhaust at uh, farm is because they have taken both bungalows, one across the other, put a, a exhaust on one of them, and closed the view, basically, with a... Uh, um, with vegetation and uh, um, I don't, I can't talk. arbor. Yes, it's uh, an arbor. Right. So you you basically cannot see what's uh, what's on the roof. On the property that I am proposing, because of the inclination of the roof, where the the, the exhaust is located, is only visible through a small angle, because there is a I know the bungalow next to it. The passageway will give you will give you the opportunity to look at the roof uh, at a certain angle, and then when you move along, uh, that's it. You don't you don't see it anymore. You see the other side of the roof and the rest of the property uh, when you come from. Um, the parking lot of La Plaza, and uh, you go. Uh, where those bungalows are located, and suddenly, boom! You see, uh, you see the property that I am uh, that I am proposing. Uh, you will not see the the exhaust because it will be on the other side of the roof, on the other inclination, which has very, very little. Uh, um, how do you say? Which offers. Uh, not that much view from uh, from the passageway. It's a very narrow kind of passageway in between uh, in between those bungalows. What I would like to add also is that the two doors that are actually in place right now are not functional. They are walled off and basically blocked. Uh, so if I open one of them, <coughs> it will have. I mean, we will, of course, save uh, what we are taking out. But the whole framing will have to be redone because those, uh, those are not functional. And uh, I imagine that when they blocked those doors from the inside, I can't really vouch for what kind of care uh, they, they did. I mean, they, uh, what kind of... Uh, Work they did in order to uh, to preserve to preserve those uh, those doors. I believe they've been uh, patched, blocked, for not forever. But uh, it would be very difficult to be using the exact same door uh, after uh, after op opening it. As uh, as far as uh, French doors are concerned, this would be the main entrance to the cafe. I, I prefer to call it a cafe instead of a restaurant because uh, we don't want to have night service. We just want breakfast and lunch. Uh, I've been an executive chef for 15 years. I know <laughs> how difficult it is to, uh, to do night service. It's basically the end of your social life, so we, we don't want that. So we, we just want to call it a, a cafe as opposed to a full-fledged uh, restaurant. Uh, so, the double doors would be the entrance to the cafe. The door on the east side 
that we plan on opening would be the entrance for um, the delivery person, for example, uh, the entrance of the uh, employees, the entrance to someone who is going the, directly to the kitchen. Um, we may have one or two tables there for people who want to drink coffee and eat croissant um, and see what's happening in the kitchen. But uh, um, the main entrance uh, to the cafe would be those, those double doors. Um, it would be very, uh, very useful for people with, with disabilities. Um, that would be the, uh, the ADA entrance to, uh, to the building. Uh, we would not need a landing area for a wheelchair with that entrance because the floors would be level with the patio. Um, so basically, um, I am not looking. The reason why I chose this particular uh, property is because it looks like an historical, but not only historical, but it looks very much like the south of France to me. Um, and uh, there is really, um, it would be defeating the purpose of, uh, of renting this property if I was to do something that, is, that would be um, challenging to, to the board or something that would uh, uh, destroy the, the historical aspect of, uh, of the property. So I'm very, uh, very aware of, uh, of those things. Now, the exhaust has always been a problem to me because I don't want to, uh, as I just explained, I don't want to destroy the 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 look the beautiful look of that uh, of that property um, I can tell you that uh, I took a picture of the exhaust of farm about a week ago and uh, as Ken was mentioning they had erected some um, uh, something around around it I went back two days after to show that to my uh, to my architect and they had fully enclosed the fan. So I don't know <clears throat> if there was uh, some kind of action from the city here that uh, prompted them to, uh, to do so, because they'd been open for some time now, and they didn't have uh, something to hide uh, the exhaust. Um, I believe that uh, hiding the exhaust and satisfy the board at the same time uh, would be a challenging thing to do, but it would be something that is, that is able to be done, absolutely. Um, so let's see, there was something else that I, uh, that I needed to mention. <clears throat> um, Eric, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Uh, board, do we have any questions of Eric while we have him here at the table? No? All right. If you have your thought? I, uh, no, I think that's about it. I thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to express myself regarding the project. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I'll remind the board that staff's recommendation is to approve as submitted. Uh, I think we've made some comments about the width of the French doors, the inclusion of perhaps some side lights. Bill, did I get that correctly? Um, the removal of the one solid wood door. Uh, to be uh, stored appropriately. And if anyone has been on the tour and have been in the basement, um, it is a huge 
uh, storage receptacle. So that shouldn't be a, a problem to uh, store it on site. Um, but uh, how do we feel about the, um, I don't know why I trip over this uh, exhaust, exhaust fan. fan. Exhaust fan, yes, over the exhaust fan. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair. Please. Um, I move that we accept staff report um, with the following conditions. Um, that the French door width um, be extended to the existing uh, outside frame of the windows um, and the inclusion of side lights uh, to the French doors and that the exhaust fan um, be concealed um, in an appropriately historic and Hispanic uh, enclosure. Is that your motion, Bill? That's my motion. Do we have a second? A second, please. A second from um, Mr. Burkett. Uh, further discussion? Todd? So I still, after hearing uh, the applicant, I see no reason whatsoever why that original exterior door needs to be changed out. I think there's a very good chance, contrary to what was said, that if it's been covered up for whatever, 50, 60 years or 40 years, it's in better shape now than it would be if it were never covered up, which is most likely the case. So I, you know, I would have to vote no because I don't see why, I'm not at all convinced why the door needs to be changed out. And if we're allowing what is somewhat significant changes to the exterior of a very significant building, why are we, are, and I understand the necessity of the French doors. I understand the necessity of the exhaust vent, but I don't at all understand the necessity of changing out an original door, which is there which you're going to turn into another door. Um, if there's something wrong with that original door and it needs to be repaired, then repair it and make it functional. Um, but that's my two cents. Could we add this to Certainly, the, would the milk uh, make a mo That's a very good point. Yes. Uh, I agree. Okay. So, so, so we we're going to add that to the motion. All right, any further discussion? Thank you, Todd, for that. I, I do agree with that as well. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, continuing on new business, <clears throat> 4C. This is case number 3.1780, Marmel Radziner, applicant on behalf of Grit Development, LLC, owner, for a certificate of approval for painting and minor exterior repairs to the Town & Country Center located at 146 through 174th North Palm Canyon Drive and 167 through 171 North Indian Canyon Drive, a Class I historic site. Staff report, please. Mr. Chair and members of the board, just before I go into the details of the application, I want to point out a couple of things. Number one, the backup materials that you have in your packet are incomplete. The applicant did not have all of the information available relative to the color samples, and so they were not able to complete that in time for the publication of our packet. I have provided you with hard copies, which we received yesterday, which you have in front of you which is a complete uh, packet with the colors that are proposed. Secondly, the colors as they print in your packets do not always print accurately. So Ms. Nikki McLaughlin of PS Modcom has the color samples that were done. I'll be passing those around. Please watch your fingerprints on these if you could and handle them gently. Uh, unfortunately, those are not referenced specifically to these drawings and so I'm going to ask uh, the applicants to go into greater detail in terms of the samples that have been provided and walk you through that portion of the proposed colors for the buildings themselves. With that, let me give you a little bit of background on the Town and Country Center. As you're aware, it was designated as a Class I site in 2016 as part of the update to the specific plan for the Downtown Palm Springs project. 
As part of that approval, there was a requirement that they have a security plan approved by the City Council subcommittee. That was done in June of 2016. That put the fencing that's in place there currently, as well as the detectors, uh, motion detectors, as well as uh, fire detectors on the buildings and in the buildings uh, in order to help preserve them. The Town and Country Center is anticipated as being the final phase of the downtown development. And so this is an interim proposal to improve the appearance of the properties, do minor repairs, until a master plan for that particular block is approved by the City Council. Uh, also, as part of the specific plan, it does require the restoration and reuse of the Town and Country Center. So that would come before you all as the Historic Site Preservation Board when they are ready to proceed with that, fa with that phase. And so again, these are intended to be interim improvements and not the ultimate restoration plan of the Town and Country Center. In terms of the buildings and the proposal, what I'd ask you to do is refer to this map as we walk through the elevations on the building. This has the addresses of the buildings, and so it's helpful to use this to orient yourselves as we're talking about the proposed changes. Let me start first with what is known as the Bank of America building, which is 152, excuse me, 146 to 152. Uh, North Palm Canyon in terms of the addressing. In terms of what is proposed for repair work, it's proposed to remove the awning that is on the building at number 152, and then also to look at changing out the signage. We have some signage uh, that is above the parapet there or above the, uh, the soffit at the first floor. And then there's also some minor mechanical equipment there also above the first floor of the building that would be removed and capped. And then the paint colors, as you see there, are referenced on the lower elevation in terms of what is proposed. And these are intended to go back to the original paint colors. And as I'd already mentioned, again, these don't print out correctly as you see them in your drawings. And so I'll ask Mr. Marmel from uh, Marmel Radziner and Ms. McLaughlin from PS Modcom to go through the colors as we talk about this proposal. On the buildings that are at 156 to 166 and 170 to 174, again, it's proposed to remove the awnings. Those would eventually be replaced. There are also some light fixtures above the first floor of the building that are not original to the building. Those are proposed to be removed, and then those junction boxes capped, and then the building would be repainted, again, going back to the historic imagery. Oops. Uh, that we have from photos and then also from the scrapings that were taken from the building itself to determine the colors. On the building at 170 to 174, it also has a courtyard facade. As you'll notice, there is a change in color on the rounded portion of that, on the courtyard portion of that, that it would go to the gray with the green accents. <coughs> Moving on to the building at 169 North Indian Canyon, um, it is proposed there are some mechanical units that would be removed from the Indian Canyon elevation and those wall surfaces repaired. And then in terms of painting, there would be the paint scheme as you see below with the garden walls one color, the main walls a second color, and then uh, the decorative portion uh, being the most intense hue there as you see in this image. And then moving over to the courtyard face of that building, again, there's some minor repairs to the walls, removing some elements that are not original in terms of awnings and uh, some panels. And then again, going back to what is intended to be the original color scheme for the building itself. And then just looking at some historic images there and the color scheme. And then the building at 168 North Palm Canyon, I believe this is also referred to as the E.F. Hutton building. Uh, no real significant changes there. There's a portion of the terrazzo wall tiles that have been painted over. It's intended to remove that paint and restore those tiles. Uh, no other significant changes to the building. One of the things they are proposing to do is to paint the insides of the windows black. And so you don't see that uh, the variety of different things that are happening there on the interior. 
Uh, and again, that's just a temporary feature that would be in place until there is a restoration plan proposed for the center itself. So that goes through an overview of what the proposed changes are. In terms of staff's recommendations, there are two key considerations I think that we need to look at here. Number one is they are proposing to change the signage on the buildings. And what I would request that as a condition of approval that they come back with a separate sign plan so we can see the specifics of where those signs will be attached and how they will be attached. There was also public comment giving that the property owner needs to work with the individual tenants in terms of that sign program. So again, I would request that that comes back to the board for review and approval. Secondly, they're proposing to remove the awnings, which is necessary to do the painting and some of the repair work, and proposing to replace those. Since we don't have details on what those new awnings would be, I would also recommend that that come back as a separate certificate of approval so that the board can review those proposed changes and the new awning structures. With that, that concludes my report. What I would ask, Mr. Chair, is that we have Mr. Marmel and Ms. McLaughlin from PS Modcom uh, come up to the table, and if they could give us more information on the proposed changes and specifically go through the details on the paint colors and the process that they use to derive those paint colors. Mr. Chair, Before we do, can please? we take a five-minute break? I'd like to see these outside in the daylight. Ah. I like that. Uh, we'll recess for five minutes. It's 1036, uh, 1045.
Okay, good morning, we'll reconvene. Uh, joining us is Leo uh, Marmo and Nikki McLaughlin. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to briefly explain why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you may recall, um, I believe it lo uh, last year, the Council appointed a preser uh, preservation group to work with grit development on the paint job, and the Palm Springs Modern Committee was chosen. So Peter and Maruzzi and myself are on the subcommittee. And I am here representing the owner of the development, uh, Grit Development. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for uh, taking the time this morning. I, I do want to emphasize that this uh, presentation and the information that you have before you is not part of the eventual rehabilitation of the town and country. This is simply an interim stabilization uh, to uh, improve the current appearance of the existing buildings. So we are not here to present a rehabilitation project. Uh, we are simply coming in the spirit of trying to improve uh, the current condition of the existing buildings. Uh, however, we would like to use this facelift opportunity to research and study uh, the original historic colors, and we are in the process of doing that. So we are working closely with Nikki uh, from the uh, PS Modcom, and also Sarah McLean from Dun Edwards, who is uh, really volunteering their services to providing to provide. Uh, analysis of the existing paint colors, uh, the drawdowns that, that we passed around earlier, um, that those have been done by Dunn Edwards, and we're very grateful for Dunn Edwards' desire and willingness to support this process in this pro bono way. Uh, we will also say that we are in the process of developing the color palette. Uh, the colors that are in the booklet uh, that were passed out uh, do not represent the final absolute colors. In fact, just yesterday, we were out there again with Sarah scraping on the building, and we removed the historic letter N from center to do some further scrapings and discovered that actually the original color of the eastern facade of the uh, town and country, building A, as it's referred to in the color uh, drawdowns. Um, in our presentation, that color is incorrect, that it was actually this blue color, um, and it's uh, actually in your packet, uh, the current packet, as um, this sign letter blue. Um, this is actually, uh, we've learned now, the unifying color throughout the entire development, it was the uh, majority of the eastern facade in the town and country, and then shows up on virtually all the buildings um, throughout the center. So we are in the process of confirming the colors. Uh, we will stay at it uh, with Nikki and Sarah until we're very confident that we have good color matches uh, in all the areas. So you see before you a kind of status report of where we are in the color research. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Mr. Um, Chair, what I might mention is that based on the testimony that Mr. Marmel has given, that they're still finalizing the colors, what I might recommend is that we have a discussion today and that we bring this item back next month once the color scheme is finalized. Would that be appropriate? Uh, I, I think what we would certainly desire, if it's possible, is to uh, hear an approval of the of the kind of strategy on the uh, proposed <coughs> repair work uh, with a condition that the final colors be approved either by this organization or through the subcommittee uh, with Nikki of the city council. Um, but to have someone have oversight on final approval, however, receive from you an approval so we can move forward with our to, submittal to the building department because we'll still need to get a building permit for uh, this uh, minor repair work. So I think the board is still looking over some of the uh, the documents here. Um, I did go through the report last evening, and um, one of the concerns that I have, uh, Leo, is that as I went through the report and I saw the word repair used, I saw the word repair used with the removal of non-original light fixtures, with the removal of awnings, with the capping of uh, light box junctions. Um, so I was looking, and I understand it is not a restoration and it's not a full, um, uh, it does not address the complete restoration, but I was looking for a little bit more understanding on repair. Um, this, this is stucco patch, uh, replacing of uh, fascia, uh, something that that says to me there is some remedial repair being done. Uh, and I didn't see that in, in the report. I think the word remedial is appropriate. We're, oh, my word. Yes. Uh, I think for us it is, we're, we're calling it minor repair. And that's simply existing holes in the building to repatch the plaster, to remove non-original light fixtures as outlined in the yep. presentation, and to then patch the material behind those um, added light fixtures. It's to do minor uh, repairs and touch-ups to the existing facades. Uh, we will remove conduits, electrical conduits that are no longer in service. However, electrical conduits and piping that is still servicing the existing buildings, we do not intend to relocate those. We will simply paint those in place. So it really is looked upon as not a rehabilitation of these facades, but just a visual improvement of the facade. We are not making any physical changes to the building to bring them back to what they were originally or to make any modifications. Understood. The and the word, <clears throat> the word visual, um, I could easily put on some rose-colored glasses and we would achieve the same uh, result perhaps. I'll recognize Nikki being here. And Nikki, you are here for more than just uh, to support Leo. You have been a steward of this building for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And I remember a phone call from you a few years ago. Uh, and I met you at the building. And the uh, overhang on the round building was literally falling down. Yeah. And I printed those pictures this morning. And it kills me that I left them in the printer. So there is, there's, Leo, again, I'm, I'm just looking, and I'm wringing my hands under the table. I am, because this is such an important building to us all. Um, to many of us before we even sat on this board. And as much as I want it to be painted, I want the paint to be applied to um, some level of repair and restoration. I, it, it doesn't have to be a full restoration, but I am just looking for more of an explanation on repairs and maintenance. The immediate, the immediate maintenance needs of the building. Can you 
elaborate on what some of those immediate maintenance needs are, aside from removing light fixtures and, and awnings that aren't appropriate? Really, the only work that we're intending to do is outlined in your package. Um, we have identified specific uh, added light fixtures, some specific uh, equipment that was put on the surface, some specific um, uh, applications of plywood and such. Uh, but really, the intention right now is to limit the work to only those minor okay. improvements. I have actually brought it to their attention too, my concerns about the state of the building and the difficulty of applying paint where stucco's missing, where paint is peeling. And so I believe these things will be taken care of in a minor repair way. In a minor repair way, I don't want to give the impression that we are in any way rehabilitating these buildings. This is simply to improve the current visual condition of the buildings. Um, this is not considered rehabilitation work in any way. I get it. Thank you. I have one question of staff before uh, the board uh, takes over the conversation. Um, staff, on uh, related relevant city actions, this is on page um, 2 of 18. Uh, on September 8th of 2015, the California State Historic Historic Resources Commission voted unanimously to deem the Town and Country Center eligible for listing on the state and federal registers of historic places and forwarded the nomination to the Natu National Park Service. What is the status of that now? I was under the impression that the owner of the building uh, objected to that. What is that current status, please? I, I believe the status is eligible to be listed. With the approval of the owner? Uh, no, just eligible to be listed. Okay. Okay, that's all I have from my notes. Board? I have a question, uh, Mr. Marble. So the limitation on the structural part of the building, which is very limited, is there a reason particularly why that's not being addressed now, of knowing that the building is to be restored properly? Um, is there a reason that there's not some more work that's being done at the present time? And how will the building show itself uh, just by having some different paint color on it? Sure. The, the reason for this work now is the appreciation that we're dealing with a significant historical monument. It will take time for us to develop a master plan for the site. We are only working on programming at the moment. We have not begun the master planning process. This will take time. It will have to be reviewed and I suspect um, go through a number of hearings here at the HSPB, uh, as well as working with the council subcommittee and ultimately the improvements uh, need to be approved by the city council. The owner is also interested in negotiating a development agreement, a long-term development agreement with the city. All of this will take time. And so in recognition that this process will not be a fast process, uh, the, it was requested of the owner that he make some minor improvements uh, because of the current condition of the buildings. So this is simply um, the owner's desire to do an interim step as we go through the more lengthy process of rehabilitation. Um, I, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm just referring back to my notes. Um, and, 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 and I don't want to sound like I'm objecting to any of this. I, I want to see this happen as much as, as the next person. Um, but staff, in the staff report on page two of number six, um, basically the top paragraph said the Town and Country Center was designated as a class one, so on and so forth. The Town and Country Center is included in block K of the specific plan. Um, it goes on to say that the specific plan identifies that restoration and reuse of the Town and Country Center will occur during phase three of the development following constructions on block A through G. 
Um, I think I saw, I didn't think, I did see on the news the other evening that the Virgin Hotel, and if I'm correct, that is uh, one of the blocks A through G? It is. It is. Um, that it is now, um, due to financing and, and other factors, uh, 20, 2020, 2022, or later. So then um, we are still looking at the Town and Country Center not happening much before 2023, 2024, perhaps. 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 Okay. So um, all the more reason I would like to see some a little more extensive repair work than perhaps that, the, that you've been hired to do. You know, I'm not blaming you, Leo. I'm just saying a little more restoration or preservation or repair work than you've been currently hired to do because this paint job that we perhaps uh, um, approve today might be six or seven years sitting there on the building before uh, more comprehensive uh, uh, restoration occurs. So again, I just want to come back to uh, encouraging a little bit more sanding, spackling, you know, those kinds of those kinds of things. Board. Dan, I have a question. Um, what is the plan for like in the building number 166, the, the alleyway or the entranceway, they spill out onto that and there's like a roof or something over it and it really distracts completely from, you know, the alignment with the museum and the whole idea of it. What, is there anything happening with that right now? There is no plan to adjust that restaurant, uh, that existing restaurant use in any way other than painting the, wall, the exterior walls of that building. How long is their lease? I don't know. I have a couple of questions. Do you have a uh, projected time frame for this once you get the authorization to move forward, how long this will take to complete? I do not have a schedule at this time. I mean, any guesstimate? The hope was to do the majority of the work over the summer. Okay. Um, and then with respect to what you're removing, um, uh, are you removing, like, with respect to awnings and lighting and things like that that are added that are non-original, non-contributing features, are you removing everything like that or just some of it? No, we are just removing some of those. To be honest, we, we don't have a full evaluation on everything that's there and whether or not it is uh, original or not. But, but you do know for a fact that what you are removing is not original and non-contributing. We okay. do, okay. yes, from historic photographs. Okay, and then um, some of these uh, where you're adding awnings, um, that's part of this current work program? It is, however, uh, as the staff report points out, there will be additional uh, submittals and approvals for the signage and for the awnings. Okay. So you're just looking for us to approve your your essential demolition and prep and paint today? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Vincent. Uh, uh, Mr. Okay. Chair, uh, to, or, or to the applicant, if you identify areas of dry rot where you know there's existing areas that you need to patch, pair, and correct, uh, will you be doing that prior to painting over those areas? The, the goal is any minor repair work that would be necessitated by a proper application of paint would have to be done, yes. However, if there's structural work or drywall work or, or dry rot damage behind the f current finished surfaces, that would not be addressed at this mm -hmm. time. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, uh, question for Mr. Marble. So, can um, realizing there's going to be some time lapse here with all this going on, uh, could there be consideration given to some sort of dressing up, if you will, the chain link fence 
in terms of canvassing um, that's you know that's going to be showing the the future uh, plans not the future plans but uh, just something that's going to really make it more attractive if we're going to do the building that 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 all because it just the bear chain link fence mm. is there any any thought being given to that well the um, original installation of the chain link fence included a windscreen the windscreen was removed uh, for security reasons so that no one could in fact uh, hide behind the chain link oh, fence okay. so it originally did include screening but for security um, purposes that okay. screening was removed I understand and and the chain link fence and all the existing um, monitoring devices that were approved by the council the intention is that all of those will remain in place uh, during <coughs> and after this okay. improvement Dick, could I just add to that? Um, I had come up with a thought of providing storyboards on the property after the painting, so it would encourage people to go back there and learn the history and the future of this building. Yeah. Something which I'll present to the board of uh, Modcom in the coming weeks. Please, Bill. Um, Years ago, I was taught to start with something nice to say. Uh, <laughs> the colors are much better outside than they are inside. Um, and, and when you paint this building this color from experience, um, there will be traffic accidents along Palm Canyon. <laughs> Wondering, and, and calls about if we lost our minds. Um, so there, there needs to be some publicity about why we're painting the building this color um, for your sanity. Um, it, it, while this seems ambitious um, and, and perhaps appropriate, I think it's premature. Um, here, having seen the building, um, and, and, and I, I think what needs to be done is the building needs to be stabilized, not repaired. You have to start with stabilizing what's there so that it doesn't continue to fall apart in, in the next five years. Um, so while there is some repair and stabilization, um, it, it needs to be characterized as stabilization. And I'd, I'd hate to see that with, um, and, and I, the term, and it's not an architectural one, but it's lipstick on a pig, that basically we're, we're putting makeup on something that needs um, a facelift. We're just spackling it. Um, and we're hiding the mistakes, rather than making an um, honest effort in, in the eventual restoration of this building. Um, and, 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 I, and I'd hate to see that, we, you know, it, two years from now, when I'm probably gone, um, that, you know, someone comes in and goes, well, we spent $50,000 repainting this lovely building, and don't you love it? We're not going to do anything else. We're going to keep it because we've made this considerable effort. Um, and while paint does stabilize a building, uh, particularly in a building that's weathered and, and not been maintained for years. Um, it's not the only thing that needs to be done. Uh, the comments about the, the awning fall, or the, the, the overhang falling down, um, those are more serious concerns to me that we not lose that um, than perhaps, you know, a light fixture gets taken out now. Um, so it, it's I, you know, somewhat reluctantly would support this, but, but again, I would rather see it characterized as stabilization. Um, one of our uh, speakers this morning during public comment is a, is a local merchant, and he just did step out of the room, so I'm sorry he might miss these comments. Um, removal of the awnings. Um, he'd mentioned how important the awning was on his store. 
This is destination PSP. And that awning is a part of the awning removal. And on that same note, I see on the diagram that the sign of the cocky cactus is being removed. Um, has the, and perhaps you don't know, but has that retailer been told that her sign is being removed as a part of the repair work here? So I want to be sensitive, certainly, to the merchants along the east side of Palm Canyon Drive because they have um, certainly endured uh, quite a bit there with the construction across the street for a long time. I was, I was surprised to hear that the east side of Palm Canyon Drive had a, uh, a, a lack of foot traffic, I think, is the note that I made. Um, yes, um, uh, uh, miss signage, signage issues, lighting issues, awning. Um, they need something to draw traffic to the street. And, uh, and as much as a lovely paint job will help, um, I'd like to, again, just see some, something that is done to enhance the building beyond a visual, uh, visually, making it more visually attractive. Um, so, uh, you know, I just have uh, my comments continue. Um, and uh, uh, the other thought was, um, uh, and I know that you've done some scraping and some forensics and all of that, but uh, most of us are familiar with the postcard history of the Town and Country Center. And there is a postcard, and uh, actually one of the board members and myself actually received an email from uh, somebody who did uh, include uh, an earlier postcard, I think, perhaps, where the colors were lighter or, or something. Can you elaborate on that? Please. Uh, at your, at your um, seats today, there were some um, miscellaneous materials that came in. And the uh, email or the comment that I think you're referencing is the one from Mr. Kalon. His comments regarding this project are in that packet that was sitting on your desk here. Keep going. It's in there. Oh, no, absolutely. All right, yes, thank you, Ken. Um, so any thoughts on that, uh, Leo, on, um, oh, yeah, I guess, it's, I guess it's here where it appears to be a much lighter palette. Bill, do you have that handy? Yeah. Yeah. Vincent? Dan? Yeah. I, I read that letter this morning. Oh, okay. And I actually agree with the comments <laughs> as it relates to the color of the east facade. Our package shows it as that red color. Um, it's actually, as it turns out, the bluish color um, on the east facade. The challenge that we have is that many of the historic photographs have faded sure. in their tone, um, which is why we're working directly with Dunn Edwards and going to the actual source, scraping down the uh, existing paint layers to get to an original layer and working from what exists on the buildings today. Uh, and then working with Dunn Edwards to get color matches uh, to the historic colors. I will say, I, I, I agree that the colors will draw a great deal of attention. I think it is important to note that the original historic colors are very saturated in their chroma. And so there will be a great attention um, drawn based on the new colors. I'd also like to add that I spoke to Steve, too, and um, encouraged him to work with us on this project. Wonderful. OK. Um, Leo, I know you're, you'd love some, some approval today, and that might still come. The full board hasn't weighed in yet. Um, but it sounds to me that um, it, it, it might be a little bit premature for uh, an approval, and with a little bit more um, uh, coalescing of, of the research here. Uh, uh, I would really, again, like you to go back to your employer and ask for some something that will benefit the retailers along the east side. You know, if we're looking at uh, coming back with an awning program later, um, I'd like to see that sooner than later so that those merchants, the Cocky Cactus, Destination PSP, 
even the the restaurant there that uh, we know uh, uh, that um, you know sort of encroaches on the on the walkway there, uh, and some of the other merchants along there get um, something given to them that encourages their their staying in the building and competing with the uh, big signage and the big lighting across the street. So I'm tasking you with going back to your uh, uh, your client, please. I said employer, but your client, um, and getting a little bit more uh, to help those merchants along there. All right, so uh, board, I think that, you know, staff is recommending that we accept this as submitted. Um, I've just uh, suggested that it might be premature for an approval. Uh, any other feedback on that? <laughs> Cooperative group you have today, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I would love to find a way to keep this moving forward myself. And I, you know, um, if it's possible, would like to see, because there's a lot of prep that has to happen before you even put paint anywhere. And I'd hate to stall even one mm -hmm. ounce being done of prevention or uh, work for another month. It just seems since we aren't going to get the restoration that we want, um, I certainly would rather have it looking cosmetically better than it does, given that we can protect it as much as it's feasible to protect it. But um, I would say that we could hopefully give them some sort of authority to move forward to some extent, and I sh certainly chair, sh share Chair Sean's <laughs> concern about the awnings and things, but I think like if we were to say, okay, we'll approve this part of it, but then next month in May, you need to bring back the signage and awning plan. Um, uh, I don't know That's if that's agreeable to my other or the other board members, whatever. I would also like to add that I have actually been into the um, 160 through 146 uh, shops and spoken to the owners. I certainly haven't discussed awnings and lighting, but they're very enthusiastic about the new paint colors. And they're excited to have the building <coughs> redone. Todd, my hesitation with approving this today is uh, given that Nikki is going to be working with Mr. or has asked Mr. Kalen to weigh in on the color uh, scheme um, that uh, you've asked for awning and, and sign program to come back, I really don't think another 30 days after almost 10 years of advocating for the restoration and preservation and historic status of this building is, is too much for this board to ask so that we have a little more complete um, idea as to what the colors will be um, given that we have opposing postcards here kind of competing with each other there's a darker palette much more saturated there's a lighter palette um, so I don't know that, that, that's my um, I'm not well if I'm tasked with making the motion, I, I will, but I'll... Mr. Defer. Chair, Please. I have a suggestion that might help. Uh, as has been requested by the applicant, what you might do is approve the minor repair work that has been identified on the drawings that are in your packet. That allows them to do some of the prep work in advance of the painting, and then hold off on the approvals of the paint colors and the awnings and the sign program uh, for the month of May. And then what you might also do as part of your motion is send a recommendation to the City Council subcommittee that the City Council subcommittee investigate additional stabilization work as soon as possible. And along with that stabilization work, some merchant enhancements to the east side of Palm Canyon Drive. So moved. 
All right. Second. Seth Lynn, you got the motion. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot make a motion, so All right. Mr. LaVoy. All right. So, Bill? As that motion is stated by Mr. Flynn. Okay. And you'll have the tape to refer back to that? Yes. Okay. Can we get a second? I'm sorry, I didn't see the... Okay, Mr. Marsh. Any further discussion? Okay. So, Leo, Nikki, thank you. Um, thank you. This is certainly a challenge, but I think the rewards are going to be so good for, for all, for the merchants, for the citizens, for the entire downtown project. So um, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you next month. Mr. Chair, you do need to take the vote on that motion. Oh, that, yes. Okay. All right. So any further discussion on the motion and the second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Flynn. That's, uh, that kind of coalesced it all. I very much appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Okay, so we are moving on to our uh, item five on the agenda. This is discussions. 5A, the 2018 National Preservation Month Symposium. Member Burkett. Okay. We're coming down home stretch. Mr. Burkett, if you could turn your microphone on and pull oh, it yeah. close to you. Um, coming down home stretch, we, um, I'm happy to report that we are um, sold out for the event uh, as of last Friday um, for the symposium as well as for the tours and the after event. And um, we, uh, and it's, and I'll, I'll share the stats in more detail at the next meeting, but I will say again, it's the organizations in this city that have really have amazing drawing power when it comes to, and everybody in the subcommittee knows my favorite word is e-blast, because it's really made a difference. Uh, and I've tracked that uh, right along. And uh, so it, <coughs> I'm really excited. I don't think we've been sold out this far in advance. So this is really great. Um, in our subcommittee meeting yesterday, uh, I mentioned to Flynn that I think it's really important for us to have our board badges yes. on um, during that event. So people will be aware to ask questions. And if I might ask the board, how many of you have your badges in your possession? Staff has our badges. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so only member Hayes may have his. So I'll make sure that those are provided in one way, shape, or form okay. or another right. on right. Sunday. Okay, very uh, good. Flynn, just to remind you, we did, we did think it was a great idea that we would turn our badges in with our signage, right. and so that each time we had the meeting, the badges would be here. So okay. unless you didn't yeah, no, come... <laughs> Sure. All right. So yeah, uh, but but I had a note also. I thought having our our our, our badges on was a good thing. So thank okay. you. So um, in reviewing the notes, I suggest that the time for the board to arrive actually is between twelve and twelve fifteen. Um, uh, there may be a little lull in that time, but I just know also there could be changes. Um, also, on the information on the HSP table, if you could just let me know what, if there's anything you want me to do about, you know, um, brochures, what we're going to do for the table, uh, that we can get those there, or if Ken's going to bring them like he has in the past. Um, Are you going to need the uh, yellow screens also, I'm assuming? Right, yeah. Okay. Right, okay. Um, also, the, uh, and Flynn's going to bring the event brochures actually on Sunday with you, right? Okay. And um, just reviewing the staff assignments that we talked about and the board uh, we talked about last meeting, uh, Linda registration, um, Dan registration, Vincent registration, um, and Flynn, and then yesterday meeting, uh, Ken we talked about, um, because we had a little glitch on the first uh, go-around, 
email that went out to the last year's attendees that there may be some unusual situations come up. And so, um, Mr. Flynn <laughs> suggested that you might help us with that. I didn't want you to be surprised, like, oh, I got drafted. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. and then uh, if Dick, Todd and Bill. We'll have Ken do both VIP and the unusual situations. Oh, great. <laughs> so good. He'll do both. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then Todd and Bill on the HSB table. And uh, then I will be floating around, <laughs> just checking on things. Um, during the uh, re registration process, we reviewed that again at our subcommittee meeting. And um, right now, uh, it, it, what's really s wonderful is that the printouts that uh, Lynn's going to bring with him on Sunday, uh, each of the individuals will have... Uh, Registrants will have their, their symposium tour and after event all in one area. So it makes it easier for like for check-in purposes. Uh, we'll have two lines again. Um, at least at this point, we may change that at the last minute. Uh, if you have to review with uh, David. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a VIP desk, that would be basically the presenters, the, t the tour homeowners, the volunteers, and the organizations, I think it's particularly important that we really pay very close attention to these folks that are really uh, making this all tick. And um, I also plan to have actually somebody helping to be available by the VIP desk when they see one of the presenters come in, particularly or the tour homeowners, to even usher them to their seats, which will be reserved. Um, which we're going to do on Saturday. Um, uh, <clears throat> with the seating chart, we're lining up all the presenters in the order in which they're going to be speaking, along with the, each, each of them have guests, and I don't know how many guests each of them are having. Um, and then um, on the volunteers at the convention center, we'll have a uh, Penny Shaw is going to be the greeter at registration line. Um, she's going to be uh, being, you know, helping us organize to keep people going to the two lines. And she knows most of these presenters, so when she sees one, she can usher them over to the VIP uh, table. And um, then the event brochures and reserve cards. I have two volunteers, Lisa and Carl Dews, who are going to be handing these out as people come in to the, uh, to the uh, Primrose uh, Ballroom. And then the VIP desk, I'll take Michelle off of that, and she'll be the usher, and because Ken will be there, is what we're saying. Parking, this is a major thing that I'd like to point out. Um, you know, since the Dream Hotel has gone up, going up, the, the uh, convention center has lost that lot. And so the lot that we have available to us is on Caballero's side. It's directly across the street. So you come into the Caballero side uh, of the center. And um, it's a fairly good walk from there, mm -hmm. getting around to the Primrose. So what I'm now I'm going to suggest to all of the, uh, particularly on that panel that we have, is uh, because they're all uh, coming with somebody that's going to drive them. I spoke with Renee about this. To have them dropped off at the main entrance at Primrose. And, and we will also, we'll be sending out a final reminder on Thursday to all of the registrants about the parking and that anybody that has any uh, you know, physical limitations, it might be a good idea to uh, block them, uh, drop them off because that front door will be open uh, for um, all of the attendees that's nearest the Primrose. Um, but that is, that is the, that's the one logistics that I, that I think we're going to do everything we can to let the people know that um, of what to ex what, what to expect when they get there. 
Um, then um, I think the next thing I'd like to just briefly review is the the workshop. Uh, I also, uh, it's your second page shows you all of the different things that we have uh, that we have done and are doing on um, the workshop. Um, we've got some very powerful things that are happening actually today. Um, the, actually, the PS ModCom second e-blast just about the workshop went out this morning. And so that's been done. Uh, the Regional Association of Realtors is doing a follow-up e-blast today. Uh, to all of their members. Uh, there'll be an e-blast with the Preservation Mirage Group and Coachella Valley Preservationist. Um, I sent out last night uh, to 125 um, sort of A-list realtors that I had been used for marketing back when I was soliciting design business. Um, and I've already got responses from that, which is interesting. Um, and then I'll be asking the museum uh, uh, and the council today and the chamber uh, if they would send out one more blast. And um, I know Gary, I think, is working on um, working with um, his office. And also there's a lot of social media going out today that Bob Bogard's doing to different groups. And we... Uh, are scheduled to have a uh, Desert Sun Valley Voice article, which my, the whole focus of the article when I wrote it is about the workshop and the importance of it. And that workshop is now also available in addition to the realtors, but to the residents and to the public at large. Um, so one thing that could still be done if the board could do uh, in some social media, putting it out there to your friends, your colleagues. Uh, I know uh, Todd did that yesterday. I, I think for the board, for more realtors, I saw a copy of that, which is really great because uh, the social media and the e blast are really what's in, what's important. But I really think it's it's vital that we. Um, this is such an important topic that we've been wanting to to get the word out for so long. And I think we, we've got every opportunity now to really build on um, the audience for that workshop. So um, I think that's my report. If there are any questions. Mr. Burkett, just one thing I wanted to mention. There is a cost to the workshop on Monday. However, we'll make sure one way or another that our board members can attend free of charge. So if you could just let me know if you will be able to attend, I'll make sure that you yeah. are available to do so free of charge. I was planning on, I was planning on crashing. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, you can put me down. I will be there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be there. Yeah. I'll be there. Okay. I'll be there. Okay. The whole so board. Everyone here. Great. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thanks, board. Uh, Dick, is that it for you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I had a quick question. Um, um, the award certificates, oh, yeah. uh, Ken and Flynn, uh, Ken, I'm assuming these are going to be drawn up by you again as you have in the past? Probably, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we have three, um, and the first two, the Desert Star and the Heyman residence, those should be of lesser value than the Legacy Award. So if you could draw some distinction I'll see what we can do. I okay. get these certificate forms from the um, city manager's office, yeah. and I don't know if they have any different types. But we'll I mean, even if it were a different color. Uh, uh, we'll, yeah. We'll find something. Okay, that's all I'm asking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the Heyman residence and the and the Desert Star are our certificate of recognition, are, and the, uh, the, the O'Donnell slash Willows is the legacy. Okay. All right, good. Any questions of Dick? Excellent. Um, you know, on uh, I was going to save this for a little bit later, but I'll use it now. 
Um, Dick and I uh, met yesterday uh, morning. Dick brought me up to speed on everything he's just brought you all up to speed on just now. And we met at the uh, new coffee at Captor Plaza. And while we were there having our meeting, just by coincidence, the owner of the property, Scott Timberlake, was in the room. And the two owners of coffee, uh, John Strom and John Abner, were there. And they came over and they uh, thanked Dick and I and the board for all that we have done to further that project along. So I wanted to just extend their acknowledgement and their thanks to the full board um, and not just to Dick and I who happened to be there. So uh, if you've not been there yet, the building itself, the complex is looking terrific. The landscaping is just beautiful and the coffee, uh, Actually, the retail space is, is really good looking, and um, we wish them all very good luck. So I just wanted to mention that. So congratulations to all the board, and thank you from the owners of the coffee and the owner of the building. Okay. Uh, so our next item of discussion is a Steve McQueen nomination, HSPB number 108, Landscape Revisions Staff. We had asked... Uh, Go ahead. I was going to say, this is just a very brief update. We do have a minor architectural application in from the homeowner to do some tree installations, and we have the proposed trees that they want to put in. We're simply waiting for the as-built drawing from them, and then we'll be able to process that. Okay. But is it really just specific to the landscaping? At this time, yes. All right. So I think that uh, one of the reasons that I had asked about this last month is <coughs> there have been a number of calls from homeowners on Southridge that this particular property has not um, complied with Southridge's homeowners associations uh, bylaws etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, whether this project was fully um, permitted by the by this by the city and questions from uh, members of this board who, uh, remember there was some concern from members of our board that we had gone ahead and recommended class one designation for a property that was under renovation and how unusual it was. Uh, Bill, if you'll weigh in on this, I think it was you and Todd who had um, concerns. Um, and so this is more about what this update was to be about. And there were some conditions that we placed that board members who had not gotten a site visit would get a site visit. There were a number of conditions from the minutes of that meeting. Um, so that's why this uh, uh, update on uh, the Steve McQueen was, was requested. I can provide some additional information on those other aspects. I've had conversations with the um, homeowner's uh, representative okay. regarding the uh, description of the work that's being done and its relative um, uh, consistency with the Secretary of the Interior standards. I had a fairly lengthy email conversation with uh, the homeowner's rep on that, so I am waiting for that to come back yet. In terms of the minor architectural work for the project, uh, the uh, Southridge Homeowners Association have, been, have provided uh, the applicant and the city with a letter rec recognizing the project and their approval of the project both for the landscaping and the minor architectural work that's being done at the site with respect to the um, windows in the maid's quarters. On the, um, my goodness, Mr. Chair, I just drew a blank on the third thing that you mentioned. No, it's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, site visits, thank you. Um, with all the things we've been working on with workshops and uh, supposedly Understood. I haven't had time to work on um, site visits, but we know those are still pending. Okay. And we don't have a date for this to go yet before the city council because we are waiting for the description to come from the applicant on the uh, renovation work that is occurring relative to the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Okay. Um, and is, is staff comfortable with how this is proceeding and, and going forward? Yes, other than it's a bit slow. Okay. All right. And our staff, our board members here that had expressed those concerns, any further comment at this time on this? Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, moving on to uh, 5C, discussions, Wellwood Murray Memorial Library, HSPB number three, Courtyard Landscape Revisions Update Subcommittee. Staff report. I have no staff report on this one. This was, I believe, something that was coming from the subcommittee on the Wellwood Library. Is that correct? What I can share with you is that there was a um, proposal requested of uh, Mr. Stephen Kalon to do um, an analysis of the proposed uh, redesign of the courtyard relative to uh, whatever material may be out there relative to its original design. And uh, a draft copy of that report was provided uh, to the library board and to the um, director of engineering, Thomas Garcia, who is the person who's taken Franco's place in terms of managing these things on the project manager side of the city. <coughs> and uh, so that uh, draft report is in review um, by both the library board and um, city staff with respect to what the original landscape was. And if basically the summary of it is, is that there's nothing left of the original landscape. And uh, the recommendations that Mr. Kalon put forth in his uh, study and recommendations is to bring some of those ideas forward in terms of what was there in terms of the design that's being proposed. Okay, so that's ongoing? Yes, it is. Okay. Gary, can I please comment about that? Being on that subcommittee, one of the things, remember, that we uh, discussed in the meeting and requested is that the, um, the the actual consulting with uh, Mr. Keelan, but also then we talked about the possibility of a joint discussion between, I think, the library board and with um, our board, and that's kind of been sitting there for a while, and that's why I wanted to bring this up. Um, so that we can get some clarity on and some finalization. So how do how do you how do we approach that to be able to take that to the next step? What we can do, and we had an email exchange with the director of the library yesterday. What we can do is put the two subcommittees together now that we have a report from Mr. Kalon. Okay. I think that would be an appropriate. That'd be great. So, so staff will go ahead and work and set up a meeting for both subcommittees to okay. review that. That way we can keep it moving along. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, excellent. Anything else on uh, Wellwood Murray Memorial Library uh, Courtyard Landscape? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to 5D, Tennis Club Historic District, Criteria for Evaluating Historic District at Applications. And we do have a uh, separate memorandum from staff on this uh, for our discussion. And there are five items determining the boundaries of a proposed historic district, defining the historic context, evaluation of each parcel against the definition of a historic site, identifying a significant concentration of related sources, and gaining property owner's support. Staff report? Thank you for completion of the staff report. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in essence, Mr. Chair and the board, uh, since this is the first time that this particular uh, assembly of board members are considering a historic district, we wanted to bring forward for your understanding the elements or the ingredients that uh, are unique about a historic district that are a little bit different from what you normally see as a historic site. You've also had historic districts that have been, uh, for the most part, uh, condominium complexes in which all of the buildings are uniform and all the buildings are contributing. So this one is really going to be more of a, uh, an analysis of an area that would, would be more traditional in terms of what you think of in terms of a historic district. Um, the other one that we have similar to this, of course, is the first historic district that was established, which is the Las Palmas Business Historic District, in which you have both contributing and non-contributing sites and a variety of different things happening within that district. So <coughs> what this is really trying to explain is the various things that are different from the analysis of a historic site. So you're looking at finding a boundary, an area that has a, this distinct concentration and that the concentration or the buildings that you're looking at are rep reflective of some particular period or periods of significance. <coughs> and then um, once those boundaries and the period of significance has been established, then you're looking at each individual parcel or site within that historic district against the definition of a historic site to evaluate whether it becomes contributing or non-contributing within the district. <coughs> and uh, as you've uh, seen when we were working on, and I don't know how many of this board was there when we were working on the 
revisions to the Las Palmas Business Historic District, but you're looking for an area where roughly more than half of the buildings that would be in that particular district would be considered contributing, so that you're really identifying a concentration in this particular area or boundary that gets defined. And then lastly, owner support. And while there is no, poli or is no ordinance or regulation requirement for owner support, uh, it's critically important that once this project starts moving forward, that we engage the, uh, the community that's there, the Historic Tennis Club neighborhood, as well as the other um, uh, building owners or site owners to explain the process of a historic district, to explain what it means to be a contributing site, the incentives, the opportunities, the responsibilities, and so on. And I will mention also, uh, I don't think there's anybody here in the audience today, but I did receive an email this morning from the chair of the Historic Tennis Club Neighborhood Association uh, who had seen this on the agenda and was concerned. And I advised him that there is no action, of course, being taken today, that this is something that is on your work plan and that it's really on the agenda today for us to kind of do some education of the board members to know how to go about doing this particular project. So that's my summary of the staff report, and I am open to any questions or comments you may have. Did the um, uh, letter writer or speaker that you spoke to express uh, what his concerns were or what their concerns were? Was he speaking on behalf of himself or the homeowners association, do you recall? Well, I took the email to be one in which he was speaking on behalf of the neighborhood organization, okay. which he is the chair. Um, and it's the normal type of concerns. We didn't hear about this. What is this about? We are worried. Okay. We don't know what this means. And I said, you know, all of this will be laid out for you systematically so that it's, you know, you will be brought along all, all the way along on this thing. If it reaches the point where the board determines that there's a recommendation on historic district that you want to put forward to the city council. Okay. So I basically tried to allay his, firm, his concerns. Sure. And I will be calling him later today. Okay. Um, so does the board, uh, was that, does that complete your staff report? Yes. Okay. So does the board still feel, um, that the, uh, historic, uh, tennis club district, uh, warrants, uh, further, uh, investigation? I see a nod or two. Bill? Mr. Chair, um, uh, just recently I read the first, um, report that was called the cultural, cultural landscape report uh, as opposed to an historic structures report or site report um, and it evaluated um, or, or told the story of a, a block area in Santa Barbara um, and how it developed from day one from Chumash to today identified a prime interpretive period um, evaluated all of the properties in a, in a general way and then some had been previously identified in a specific way uh, in, in structures reports. Um, and it was an interesting document. I, I, I forgot to bring it with me this morning as I ran out the door, but I, I'll give it to Ken. Um, and it was, um, it was a thick document for a block, um, yeah, but, but it was very interesting. And, and it, it allowed um, that, that commission to evaluate potential development on, on, within that block. Um, and how it would affect the historic patterns of development. So it's a very interesting document, and I don't know if we're going to get one yet. Um, but but it was. I mean, it's sort of like it, it was like preliminary to what we had seen in other areas where we have several historic districts. So um, I'm used to the process, and this is the process. It's you you do this, you use surveys, you gather information, you talk to neighbors, and it's a long process. So, but the staff seems to be doing the right things right now. So, yeah, I think we should proceed with it if if that's the desire. Okay. Dick? Would it be wise to uh, have this gentleman and who represents the association, uh, maybe we schedule a meeting um, so that, you know, we can have an open discussion so they get comfortable and understand what it is before we take the next step? Would that be a, a logical way to approach this? Um, there's, there's certainly got to be outreach to the community, and I think it's wise to have it at the right milestone or the right part in the overall process. Um, 
again, I, I want to just apologize because with all the activities that we've been working on with workshops and symposia and uh, so on, um, I've not put much mind share to this particular um, part of your work plan. Um, th there's going to need to be a, a what we would similarly, what um, I'm sorry, Bill is talking about, uh, <coughs> we'll need to bring in some consultants on this project. This is a big project. And um, the involvement with the community is critically important. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's uh, a project that though takes place probably with the consultant involved at that point, um, rather than to bog down a regular HSPB meeting with a large amount of Q&A from a community or a neighborhood. I think it would be more wise to do that as a uh, meeting within the project with the neighborhood, the people that are interested or curious. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that you know that kind of outreach and Q and A can occur. Yeah. So at least there's we're paving the way. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Ken, on your memorandum <laughs> to us this morning, um, is this for um, us to just uh, accept and sort of file? Is there a next step? Should we discuss some of these uh, bullet points so that we begin to? Um, understand each other's thoughts on it. What is your recommendation, please? Well, our purpose in bringing it forward today was to really just get your brain thinking about it, to uh, acknowledge that uh, part of why this came about is several of the um, individual sites that you were looking at for your work plan this year are in the historic Tabor, uh, tennis right. club neighborhood. And so uh, rather than chase around and do this site and that site, uh, you had looked at this and said, you know, collectively there's a, there's a benefit here to uh, doing this rather as a district rather than chasing individual historic sites. Right. Uh, so that was the genesis of why this is a district on your work plan rather than three more individual okay. sites. Um, so, yes, the answer is there is more input that we need. What I really did this for uh, is to kind of get your brain thinking about the distinctions and the differences between what you would go through if you're analyzing an individual site versus what you're doing in terms of a district. And I have not had time to go back into the um, uh, uh, citywide historic context surveys, but I believe there's some information in there. Um, if you remember, there's a section of the uh, analysis that the firm HRG did in which they identified several areas around the city where they found a particularly uh, noticeable concentration of similar resources. And so we'll probably start with that document, re-look re at that to see what they had found in the Historic Tennis Club neighborhood in terms of uh, that concentration um, and begin launching it from that point. Okay. But the purpose today really was to just bring it forward as a, as a reminder that it's a little bit different. You've got some other things to consider and that we will be working to guide you through this as well as to bring the neighborhood uh, into the discussion. Okay, so thank you. And so I no would like necessary. I would like to uh, further this and um, um, defining the historic context, I would just like to add something here. Um, it is certainly the period of significance of an area or district, persons or uh, significance associated with a proposed area or district, unique or distinguishable pattern of development that is characteristically unique. On this um, subject, and it has come up recently, um, that the walls and the ruins of the tennis club, I think, be included in this historic context. In the uh, Historic Resource Survey, um, they're not there. They're not there, and I think that they should be. So if we can add the, the many walls in the Historic Tennis Club District and the ruins um, that are there, uh, that we add these to the conversation now so that they become a part of the historic context that we're looking at. Um, the, uh, there are, have been a number of uh, uh, documents or journals written over the last few years. Patrick McGrew's uh, Desert Spanish Journal includes quite a bit of research already on the historic tennis club district. 
uh, Steve Vaught, or Vons, a Vaught, I think it is, uh, Sentinels in Stone, includes a lot of work on the, uh, or talk about research on the, okay? Yep. And uh, Mr. Kalon's recent um, Herbert Burns journal also talks a lot about the historic tennis club district. So I, for one, again, think it's very worthy. If we need some further discussion today, I'm happy to have it, but I wanted to make sure that the walls and the ruins were a part of it. Uh, one thing here, um, in determining the boundaries, we're not really talking about geographical boundaries like uh, Ramon Road on the south and Alejo on the north. Are we? Are we? Yes. Okay, so we are. So should we maybe have some conversation about um, defining a little bit of what were our initial thoughts are on the boundaries? I would recommend that we don't have that conversation okay. yet. I think there needs to be some additional study in terms of what is really the concentration of historic structures. Once you have that, you can then establish the boundaries by looking at the contributing versus the non-contributing okay. structures. So I think an additional study has to be done before we can okay. finitely establish those boundaries. And what I might suggest is, if you're looking for a homework assignment, is that their uh, board go in and look at the context statement with respect to the tennis club neighborhood as well as that portion on historic districts, because I think there's some stuff in there about the tennis club. Okay, and that is, I think I have a flash drive of it somewhere. It's online. At home, but it is website. online now. Okay, good. And is it remaining a draft? It is currently a draft. <laughs> now that we have the addenda okay, good. that has been approved, right. uh, we'll move forward to City Council. All right, excellent. Okay, thank you. Any other discussions on um, the historic district? Okay, great. Um, Cornelia White residence, stabilization project update. Staff. Uh, I don't have a lot to report on this. Uh, I last spoke, as you know, Franco um, has left the city for other um, work opportunities. So Thomas Garcia, who is the director of engineering, is currently shepherding the many capital projects that the city is working on. Um, I think this is uh, their goal was to try to bring this to city council uh, in one of the upcoming meetings in terms of funding approval. Uh, and then we had talked about the issue of um, documentation. We've looked at that a little bit. Um, so the project is not yet really fully funded yet, and uh, we're waiting sort of for the project to come back before City Council for okay. the funding approval. So the funding for the restoration project. That is correct. Okay. So, um, Board, you might remember there's been some conversation about um, documenting the process, um, and uh, we've talked about a video or, or going we, out to video. We, we did, and I went out and uh, solicited uh, from our procurement department a number of firms that have done video work for the city in the past. We received some proposals. Um, we've evaluated them with the director of procurement. Uh, we, it's a really a, a funding issue. Okay. So, um, and as is always the case, there is no money. We know that there's no money. I don't have any money. You don't have any money. There's no money. Yeah. However, however, um, it could be it could be raised through private donation. Uh, the, the cost of the video to to do a video. If okay. someone is willing to step forward, okay, that would be fine. So, um, and I have had some conversations, of course, with some of the local nonprofits about <coughs> contributing to this, and. Um, in an initial conversation, um, some of these nonprofits would like the city to at least have a, a, a finger on the scale, a finger on the scale. So not certainly not assuming the full cost, but contributing to the cost. Um, and is there any action that this board can take? We've written letters to the... Oh, you want to answer me already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there might be a way to do that. Okay. Um, but just keeping in mind the time frame that we're working with, it's very difficult for the city to go through the process of entering into the legal documents to have co-participation in this type of thing, that it becomes very difficult. Uh, the other thing that we need to be aware of is neither Ken nor I as staff members can solicit for donations. You as appointed members to a board should not be soliciting donations either. So we have to be very careful in terms of how this might occur. 
Um, but yes, there might be a process for the city to participate with some other organization in terms of doing a video of Cornelia okay. White. But just keep in mind the time frame and the costs associated with that. Okay. So what if, hypothetically, that one of the nonprofits took this project on and the city only contributed to the project? That may be a possibility that warrants further discussion. I thought so, too. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anything else, board, on our wonderful Cornelia White House? I think we're excited that it's going to get restored. Um, anything? Okay. Um, uh, moving on, uh, 5F, case number 3.1074, Historic Landsta Landscape Assessment and Recommendations for Francis Stevens Park and School. Mr. Chair and members of the board, we just wanted to provide you with a copy of the report that was prepared by Mr. Kaland. Uh, as you had requested, you wanted some additional information in terms of how we might go forward with a master plan for the school on the park site. Mm. So this will serve as a basis. You'll notice in the report that there are recommendations in terms of landscape materials, etc. So we will forward this to the uh, city's director of maintenance and operations. They have engaged a landscape architect. We will sit down with them, review the report, and work on that plan. Uh, as we move forward, as has been recommended by the board, that we will also have any final master plan reviewed by the Architectural Advisory Committee. They will make recommendations to you all as the Historic Site Preservation Board. The master plan would come back to you for review and approval in terms of its impact to the historic resource. So that's where we stand, and so we'll continue moving forward with the master plan for the site. Thank you. And if I may, Mr. Kalon has remained in the audience throughout this uh, uh, meeting. And may I invite Steve to the table, please? Uh, Steve, you, we might have some questions for you. Uh, your name, I'll wait till you get to the table. Just introduce yourself into the mic. Hello, I'm Stephen Keelan. All right, thanks. So Steve, your name has come up twice today, associated with both the Francis Stevens Park and the Wellwood Murray uh, Library Courtyard. Um, thank you for your letter of, of yesterday. Um, do you have anything you'd like to, to add? For Francis Stevens Park? or uh, Yes, specifically, since that's our, that's our uh, um, I think it's all in the report, item. but it's, you know, the city is the steward of a really important landscape by probably the most important landscape architect to have worked in the Coachella Valley in the 20th century. And the city has all the plans, so we know exactly what was planted. And so any uh, changes or interventions that happen going forward should be keeping in the character and the simplicity of the palette that was originally designed. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for that. Any questions or uh, comments to Steve? Mr. Chair? Please. Um, this is the first one of these I've read, um, and it's an excellent report um, it, it, in both what it records but, but how it allows us to move forward. Um, with a with a, a new design. Uh, thank you very much for sure. it. It's excellent. Anything? All right, Steve. Thank you for staying for the uh, for the meeting. Of course. All right, excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, that uh, completes our uh, discussion items. Uh, board member comments. Anyone? Mr. Chair. Please. Staff. Uh, what's the status of the designation of the Racket Club? Ah. I understand it's an escrow. It is in escrow. Um, I was going to bring that up under staff member <laughs> comments, but I'll go ahead and address it now. I have been approached by the potential owners who are in escrow on the property and have an interest in doing restoration work on the property. What I've discussed with them, since we haven't moved forward to city council yet on the designation of the site, is that we would want to involve the Historic Site Preservation Board in looking at their plans for the property. And so we'll be scheduling a site visit with Historic Site Preservation Board members here in the near future. I have a conference call with them early next week to look at that, and so the idea is to have you on site and to look at the condition of the buildings as they stand currently. I believe when we had this before you before, we didn't get much of a site visit, we did we? We did not get any okay. site visit. 
So this will give you an opportunity to see the, the individual buildings on the site, which is what I'm hoping. And uh, also we'll be providing some direction to the hopefully new property owner in terms of preservation of those existing structures that are so important. So. So we can really touch the hallowed ground? <laughs> <laughs> that is my sincere yeah. hope, yes. You can hop the fence can, in my unit. <laughs> right. Has it been announced to the, who's in escrow yet, or is that still uh, private? Uh, no, it has not been announced yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. And um, so, but it, it, it appears that they're talking about both restoration and new building, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So you're comfortable with that. Okay. Well, what I, what I would add to that conversation is that I also got a phone call from one of the previous owners of the property, Mike Mueller. Mike Mueller owned or purchased that property back in 05 and began most of the work that uh, the new build that is there today. Um, and he did contact me. He has been uh, hired by the potential owners. Uh, he did tell me, and I'm not remembering the details. He did tell me who the, the who was in escrow. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it. It's an LLC, um, and that uh, they would be going forward. I was encouraged that they had hired him only in that um, he does have some uh, uh, historical history, institutional uh, history on the on the property. And uh, Mike only called me because I've known him for, you know, 25 years, long before he had anything to do with the tennis club, or excuse me, the racket club. So I think that uh, when it does start to come forward and we do start to get these site visits, uh, I think we're going to be very excited about what we see and the potential for it and all of that. So um, any, uh, okay, so we're still on board member comments. Anything? No. Nope. I have one other Please? question. Uh, back to Flynn on this. So then uh, how does this affect the going forward with the designation? That's something that we'll want to pursue further with both the board and the city council and the property owner. So we'll look at that. I think having a site visit will be an important first yeah. step for you all as the historic site preservation board. Um, and even if it's not designated, having your participation would be required, I think. Um, if they were to do any additional new structures on the site, Planning Commission would review it, and ultimately Planning Commission would want the input of the Historic Site Preservation Board on any changes to the property. Okay. okay. Um, I have a couple of quick comments. Um, <clears throat> we spent a good portion of our meeting this morning talking about La Plaza and um, making some uh, changes there to encourage uh, a new restaurant, to further the, uh, the viability of La Plaza. And uh, I was downtown recently at La Plaza, and I noticed a few things that I immediately turned to Flynn uh, and set my hair on fire about. Um, <laughs> and uh, Flynn, thank you for your continued hand-holding of this chair. Uh, but I have learned now how easily it is for any one of us, any citizen, to file a code compliance um, issue. And I want to go on record. I am very pro-business. And two of the businesses that I recently um, complained about are favorites of mine. Bill's Pizza in La Plaza has up a temporary net fence with some metal stanchions that I brought to code enforcement's attention. Uh, the wonderful ice cream, great shakes, uh, if you haven't had one of those, they're addictive. Um, uh, multiple signage, multiple signage, and, uh, and signage that was um, made out of PVC pipe and some stretched material uh, attached inappropriately to the building. And we just spent a lot of time on, on the visual enhancement of La Plaza that I think that um, I certainly don't want to hurt anyone's business, but we have an obligation to be uh, stewards of, of our Class One historic properties. And in this particular case, um, 
I, if you see something, I think we do need to say something because we can't sit here volunteering our time to make sure this new cafe has this terrific look and it fits in and it has the character and it attracts a, a, a person like him who wants to be in this historical building if we turn a blind eye to some of these uh, 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 code, uh, code um, uh, yeah, things. Code enforcement. Enforcements, enforcements, okay. Um, that's all I have on that. Uh, anybody else? Please. Uh, it's an invitation from uh, Melissa Ritchie. Uh, Melissa Ritchie is an author, and she's quite involved with uh, preservation and started, uh, actually, uh, Mir uh, Preservation Mirage um, over in uh, Rancho Mirage. She's invited our board, complimentary, to do a tour with her of the Tamarisk area on April the 17th, and no, I did not make this a part of the event. <laughs> and, uh, but she has invited our board, and if you'd be interested in that, I can, get, I can send it to Ken and let Ken send out to everybody uh, the information on it, but it's going to be like at 8 o'clock in the morning, early in the morning before it gets warm. Uh, and it's about a two-hour uh, about a two-hour tour, but she is really good, uh, and she really knows her, her uh, she really knows her stuff over there. So I just wanted to let, and I'll get over to Kim. I'd like more information on that. Thank you. Okay, that completes our staff comments. Uh, I'm mean, sorry, board comments, staff. I just have one comment for you. It was announced at the last city council meeting that there will be some modifications to oh, the dais you. of council chambers. Uh, as you're aware, we made upgrades last year, and we're having some challenges, shall I say, with some of the things relative to the improvements. One of the concerns that the council has is the height of the dais. It prevents them from seeing the audience very well. Uh, and so we might look at making revisions to the proportions of those things. I don't believe that there will be any changes to the materials or the colors uh, in terms of the improvements that were made. It's, it's mainly dimensions and details. Um, and so the city council announced that that will probably be occurring during the summer, during the month of August, it may take approximately four to six weeks. Just wanted to make you aware that that work may be going forward, but we don't have the specific details on that yet. All right, and Ken, uh, Flynn, thank you for that because I was watching the city council meeting the other night when they talked about um, these modifications to the dais, and uh, so I did ask Ken or uh, Flynn to uh, uh, educate us on that. And if they can't see the audience, uh, the audience has difficulty seeing them too from certain seats in the in the auditorium. So uh, probably uh, needs some rethinking. Probably that's it. Ken. Um, in, addition, oops, sorry. Uh, in addition to the symposium on the 15th and this workshop on the 16th, <coughs> we are uh, hosting um, a uh, workshop of the Office of Historic Preservation, Sacramento, on Monday, May, I'm sorry, beg your pardon, Friday, May 11th, we'll be at the... Um, Women's Club building, mm -hmm. and this will be one of the series of Office of Historic Preservation workshops that I often send you flyers mm -hmm. about. It will be open to the public, and we'll put more announcements out uh, as it gets closer. But it uh, is basically a uh, workshop uh, that brings in the OHP staff members, and they're going to be talking about preservation tips and, and uh, tools as well as information generic about Mills Act. Uh, Mr. Kalon will actually be um, making a presentation, uh, so it's one that I think uh, the board would probably enjoy uh, attending if you are available. And um, Mr. Kleindienst will be giving his um, lecture on the La Plaza. So most of us have taken the tour. He's now taken his tour and converted it into a lecture so that's an all-day workshop that will happen on Friday, May 11th at the Women's Club, and it will start at 9 a.m., and again, information will go out shortly on that. Great, and the charge for that? 
free of charge? I think those are free of charge. Okay, yes. wonderful. I'll put it on my calendar now because, uh, and I did see um, uh, Will Kleindienst talk uh, as a part of the Historical Society's PS Talks program that, that <coughs> like I mentioned earlier, um, he did convert that tour into an hour uh, talk and it's as entertaining as informative, um, sorry, um, as you can imagine. I just turned it on, so naturally it's, it's just it's it's letting me know about all that it. Uh, oh dear, okay. Anything else? That's it. Thank you. All right, board. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.